Falcone? Here. Horton? Here. House? Here. Schneider? Here. Williams? Here. Mayor Bloom? Here. Do we have any public comment not on the item, though? You know, I didn't check those switches. Slips, I didn't. Either. Let me just look at them real fast. They all say item 17. Uh, item 17, item 17. I think that's what all these are. Um, I think. Let's see. Concerned citizen Porter. Okay. Got it. So these are all in the item 17. Okay. Will you please read item 17? Item number 17, appeal of Historic Landmarks Commission approval for the East Cabrillo Boulevard Sidewalk Improvement Project. Okay. What, uh, this is an appeal, and the way it goes is that the staff will take at most 20 minutes, and then the appellant will take 30 minutes, the applicant will take 30, the applicant happens to be the city, uh, up to 30, I should say, on all those. And um, then the public has 30 minutes, and the last thing is that the council has 30 minutes, and we haven't done that before, but I have a feeling this, this uh, appeal could go the whole, uh, more than a couple hours. So when it comes to the council taking 30 minutes, um, that's a little over four minutes each. Does that work? Yes. Okay. We'll start with the staff. Uh, Mr. Lamont. Madam Mayor, uh, Council Members, good evening. You have 30 minutes, but you don't have to use he them had, all. Yeah, they have 20 minutes. <laughs> That's what we're supposed to say at the beginning. There you go. Okay. Uh, Madam Mayor, I do intend to summarize and provide just an outline of the issues, and I'll save um, some additional discussion with uh, appropriate city staff that are here to answer questions, and, as well as the applicant. First of all, um, the project you have before you that's being appealed uh, is in direct result of a landscape proposal being proposed for the 0 to 800 blocks of East Cabrillo Boulevard. The Santa Barbara Arts and Crafts Show uh, has filed an appeal of the Historic Landmarks Commission approval of the landscaping component of the sidewalk improvements. Uh, they have cited various concerns regarding the access to the show on the weekends. The appeal issues are focused on concerns about these proposed landscape improvements and what may might uh, happen with uh, the access directly uh, from the, the parking on East Cabrillo Boulevard. Um, before we go forward, I'd like to describe briefly what the project entails. Uh, it is a proposal to demolish and remove and replace 5,200 uh, 5, lineal feet of sidewalk with the same color texture scoring pattern. Uh, the East Cabrillo Boulevard has been identified as a state uh, historic Parkway District. Uh, there is a landscaping and parkway um, a, a segment of the uh, district that is determined has been determined to be a contributing element of this historic district. There is also new landscaping with irrigation proposed for the four-foot wide planting strips at several points along East Cabrillo Boulevard. There are currently 18,000 square feet of planter strip area which currently exist in that area, but only 7,000 of that uh, square feet of that area is proposed for new landscaping. And of course, the conflict arises because this happens to be the location where the Santa Barbara Arts and Crafts Show um, has their show on the weekends. This is the uh, segment of East Cabrillo Boulevard where these improvements are planned. And as you can see from the current conditions, this is uh, quite an old uh, sidewalk that is in very good uh, need of repair. And as you can see from the parkway, there's not uh, <laughs> much landscaping in that area. Uh, one of the issues before you today is what exactly is the uh, historic significance of that parkway. And as outlined in our staff report, there have been uh, so several uh, historic structures reports and analysis re prepared for the benefit of the Historic Landmarks Commission. And what they have uh, determined is essentially there was a uh, landscaping component at one point along this way that has deteriorated to a point where it no longer exists. And the uh, intent of the Historic Landmarks Commission is to see some of this landscaping return to its uh, previous condition. Uh, again, the uh, appeal decision was filed on September 19th uh, uh, as a result of a September 19th uh, final approval decision. And the concerns uh, deal with also operational concerns for the loading and unloading operations associated with the weekly arts and crafts show. As you can see, this is a typical section of the sidewalk improvements. It involves uh, landscape planners that are uh, in and around the existing light posts at several locations. It involves a proposed wrought iron that would uh, surround uh, the light posts and uh, offer an opportunity for vines to grow. 
Uh, there are also locations uh, where planters are uh, directly opposite the red curb area, and that seems to be also an area where there's a conflict potential. The Historic Landmarks Commission reviewed this project starting in December 2004 uh, up until the approval in September 2007. So you can see that it involved quite a bit of discussion. There were actual uh, different alternatives presented along the way for the uh, uh, applicant to uh, propose uh, different solutions that would uh, give uh, the Historic Landmarks Commission the type of um, uh, preservation that they would like to see with respect to um, the landscaping and the parkway itself. Uh, there was consistent direction given to the applicant to provide additional landscaping and not other paving alternatives. So those have been discarded as a result of uh, the analysis that was prepared by the historian of, of record. And those historians are here to answer questions with respect to what type of impacts there may be with uh, the proposed landscaping and with any proposed changes that may, may uh, be offered. Uh, they reviewed historic structures reports. Those were reviewed by our his urban historian who's here today, Jake Jacobus, as well as Historic Landmarks Commission and the State Historic Office of Pres Preservation, SHPO. And um, they, they determined that there were character-defining features uh, along the Cabrillo Boulevard that needed uh, preservation. Uh, along the way, they did hear public comment, and there, they did, in fact, um, uh, change the proposal to increase the amount of paving uh, that was uh, uh, suggested in order to provide better access for the, the um, participants of the Santa Barbara Arts and Crafts Show. Uh, they developed a compromise which allowed new paving, and I'll get into that a little bit, uh, as well as the applicant will be here to explain fully the proposal. Uh, I think it's important for you to, uh, uh, or everyone to understand the historic significance level of East Cabrillo Boulevard. Uh, because it's uh, eligible for inclusion in the National Register of Historic Places, there is, in fact, uh, uh, in evidence that this parkway has a long history of its design and uh, the configuration of it for public access as well as the improvements that were made. Um, in 1995, the city agreed to a preservation covenant with the state which agreed to maintain and preserve the and enhance the district. This was part of the relinquishment agreement for State Highway 225. Uh, as part of that agreement, it actually cites that the city shall not alter the original or significant historical fabric or transfer, relocate, or demolish historical resources which would affect the integrity or appearance of the district. So there's very uh, specific direction to be careful about the alterations. And it required that notice and review be required to the State Office of Historic Preservation, which has occurred uh, on this proposal. It's also important to understand the definition of rehabilitation. Rehabilitation is defined as a process of returning a property to a state of utility through repair or alteration, which makes possible an efficient and temporary use while preserving those portions and features of the property which are significant to its historic, architectural, and cultural values. It is staff's belief that um, the historic landmarks took this to heart and believed that the landscaping comp component was an important uh, element of the district that needed to be uh, returned to its previous uh, design. The historic character of the property shall be retained and preserved. The removal of historic materials or alteration of these features and spaces that characterize the property shall be avoided. So again, it gives specific directions to the Landmarks Commission uh, in order to comply with the Secretary of Interior Standards for Rehabilitation. And then finally, which I think is an important element, is replacement of missing features shall be substantiated by documentary, physical, or pictorial evidence. And that was provided to the Commission. There is evidence that there was landscaping in these planter strips. I'm going to briefly outline some of the appeal issues that were raised by, raised by the appellant. Uh, the first one was, or is, 50% uh, of Sunday parking will be significant obstruct, significantly obstructed and 75 to 100 show members are unable to reach these spaces. Um, staff response on this is that there, there is an agreement that this proposed work may hamper some of the loading and unloading operations. There was a compromise developed again to allow for 25, 24 inches of curbside hardscape area to be added to facilitate loading and unloading. H uh, the HLC was open to adjust the planner areas to accommodate these new paving areas at the curb. And uh, the this chair of the Historic Landmarks Commission, Mr. Lavoie, is here, will, will, will fully explain uh, the rationale for adding this type of uh, paving. Uh, we, the staff are not in agreement that the artisans or show members are unable to reach their spaces. Appeal issue number two 
Uh, the agreement to allow the lane closure for, for safe loading and unloading in the red zone, easterly of the Arts Craft Show, has been rescinded, impacting 40 to 80 show members. Again, staff's response to this is it is accurate. However, the number of artists and show members is incorrect. We believe that in this area of uh, Red Curb area, 500-foot length near the intersection of Cayo Cesar Chavez, ha we have investigated this issue, and we believe that there is a possibility of having a lane closure. Um, there is a cost estimated associated with that that the uh, Public Works Department staff and uh, Parks Department staff have been working on towards uh, lowering the cost of this uh, estimate. And uh, Brownie Alley will be also providing you with some additional information and explain how uh, this issue can be uh, hopefully resolved. The final uh, appeal issue uh, is the public at large will be unable to enjoy unencumbered access to and from their vehicles. Again, staff's response is we disagree with that, that we believe that there is a major component of this uh, project that introduces new paving that it actually will facilitate access by providing paving where there is dirt uh, planter area and actually increase the access at some points. Um, there is uh, an acknowledgment that this uh, plan attempts to balance the new aesthetic improvements with access from parked vehicles. In some cases, there will be landscaping where there is not landscaping uh, presently. The uh, Santa Barbara Arts and Crafts Show also has specific requests, and they are removal or scaling back of the planted spans between the light posts, uh, secondly, the rec reconsideration of unloading and loading plans for the large portion of the craft section, which is red zoned. And then finally, the reconsideration of proposed planting and species based on the sustainability and maintenance concerns. I think it's important to also, uh, if council is open to consider uh, revising the project and removing some of the landscaping, it's um, uh, important to recognize that there are uh, implications of that, those design changes, and a significant change to a project would require a reevaluation of the CEQA exemption or the cost exclusion and the, the SHPO review. And what we mean by that is that this project was given uh, exemptions uh, based on the determination that there would not be a significant or adverse impact to the historical significance of the district. And if you were to change the project, it would entertain revisiting those decisions. Council could also uphold appeal and modify or make changes to reduce the landscaping. Again, uh, there is some consideration that if there is uh, a less than significant impact, it uh, could be determined that, and our historians are here to answer some of those questions if you're uh, considering that type of uh, project change. And finally, obviously, the de denied appeal uphold the HLC decision would allow the project to move forward uh, and allow it to go out for bid and permits to be issued. And um, those are the changes or the options that council could consider. It is staff recommendation that you deny the appeal and uh, uphold the Historic Landmarks Commission approval on the, uh, that was uh, unanimously approved. If you uh, have any questions now, we have Brownie and Allen that would walk you through the uh, lane closure issues. Okay. Madam Mayor, I just wanted to ask a definitional okay. question, please. Um, Mr. Lamont, um, the uh, you, used, you talked about the rehabilitation project, and I know in the um, post Hazeltine analysis they distinguished it from a restoration project. And would you help us with the difference between those two? I'll attempt to do so, and Mr. Jacobus wants to jump there. I'll let him do that. But as I understand it, uh, the restoration is to try to return it to its period of significance and establishing that period of significance and returning it to some resemblance of what was originally there. And as we, we move forward on this project, there was a clear understanding that we couldn't accomplish that level of landscaping given the area of planting involved. And there was a compromise to introduce new paving where there is no paving and also introducing landscaping where there may be paving. So it's, it's not a true restoration. I, mean, I don't know if you want to elaborate on that. So a true restoration would be to actually bring it back as best as you could to whatever period of time has been determined to be historically significant. And the rehabilitation is to, um, is to be in the spirit of it, so to speak, and, and not necessarily try to get every exact thing the same way it was originally but get along with the, same, the basic idea of the program. This is Madam, Jacobus. Madam Mayor, members of the City Council, that's, that's a correct interpretation. If we were to do a complete restoration, we would be having to take up all of the additional concrete that's between the original sidewalk and the curb and 
there was a photograph that Mr. Lamone had that showed the planting strip that went virtually down the entire waterfront. So that would be a restoration. So by doing a, a rehabilitation, we're taking it, we're adapting it for modern use, um, we're making compromises to allow access, but at the same point, uh, keep enough of the original feeling so that it's, it does represent its period of significance. And that period of significance is the date of the, that postcard that we saw, but not like at another time where there were just trees or something. Well, they, they, it's difficult because of the, the photographic documentation we have is not great. We don't have you know year by year documentation of how it looked. We do know that um, the, the importance of this uh, waterfront is that it's one of three significant waterfront areas that were during the city beautiful movement at the turn of the century were set aside for public use so that private development couldn't occur on the waterfront. Uh, Chicago did it, uh, Miami Beach did it, and we did it. And so it's a very important planning concept and that's why it's uh, eligible at a national level for uh, historic designation. I'm so sorry to persevere on this, but the, but the actual is it, is it really the date of the postcard, or is it the other pictures that we've seen that show trees and no landscaping? I guess we've picked out the postcard date as the time. We're yeah, the, the, in the report, and I can't remember exactly what the period of significance was. It was a span of years, perhaps. Uh, Tim, uh, yeah, Tim Basil time, Basil time associate. You need to come up to the microphone here. Let me turn that on. There. Oh. Is this fine? Um, Just walk up there, because that works. <laughs> Um, Madam Mayor, I'm Tim Hazeltine with Post Hazeltine Associates, and we prepared the historic resources report. Mm -hmm. And the period of significance for this property is essentially the period of construction, which is late 1920s through the early to mid. Oh, the period of significance is the late 20s through mid 1930s, when that period when the boulevard was developed. And as was just noted earlier, the precise planting palette of the original period is not well-known because there aren't good photographs, but it's clear from the documentation that the planter strip was planted. And by the early to mid-1950s, that was red geraniums and a smaller shrub. So there was a history of plants in the plant planting strip. Now, the exact species that were planted in the early 1930s, we were not. We don't have documentation for that. Okay. Okay, Mr. House, you sit. Okay. Okay, Ms. Falcone. A couple of just quick foundational questions. Um, the money was the money for the sidewalk repair was earmarked by the RDA or by the RDA board in uh, what year was it earmarked? My memory wants to say 2003, 2004, 2002, something like that. I think, I think, it's I think it was 2003. I'm not sure. Uh, Madam Mayor, uh, Councilwoman Cal uh, Falcone, Dave Gustafson, Acting Community Development Director. I believe that the sidewalk project was in our first bond issue that we did in 2001. Yeah. And uh, at that point, we had a very loose conception of what that side pro sidewalk project was. And we be. reconfirmed it, I seem to remember, in 2003 or four, something like that. Well, we've reconfirmed we it for a number of times, but. In okay. 2005, when you did your whole reassessment the of the capital project, you left that money in place for the sidewalk and, and the money, the amount was $2 Three, million? $3 million. $3.1 million. $3.1 million. And the cost, if we went forward tomorrow, would be how much? I don't know if we have an estimate at this point. Uh, I might ask Brian <laughs> Bossy if he Excuse has me. that information. I'll bet it's not 3.1. Mr. Bossy. Uh, good, good evening, Madam Mayor and agency board members. Um, cost estimates, as you just stated, originally budgeted was $3.1 million. We're still confident that, that that amount of funding can get this project done. Um, there have been some scaling back issues and changes in the project from when it was complete hardscape to what it is today. Um, but we don't have a, an engineer's estimate as to the actual cost. But we've been working on the the idea that that we're so still within we might budget. Be able, as as recommended, whether or not that's approved tonight or not, who knows? But as recommended, you think you could go forward with the allocated money of three point one? That sure is our hope, and that's been what we planned from the beginning. Yes. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Schneider. Thank you. I want to go back to the postcard for a minute. 
the postcards circa 1955, 1960, we, we just heard that we don't know uh, the species of plants that were there. Do we know, do we know in the 1920s, mid-30s, when that's the period of significance, whether the entire parkway was planted or what the design of the parkway? I mean, that, you mentioned one piece about what was planted that we're not sure of. Do we know to what extent any plants were planted? Was it, do you see where I'm going with this? Madam Mayor, members of the City Council, we don't know, for, we know that the parkway strip was there. Right. And um, we know that the sidewalk was there, but we don't have photo documentation to tell us exactly what time or what type of plantings went in. Um, and how much. And how much. Okay. And my second question has to do with what triggers going back to getting the state to review it again. If I'm just saying that I'm not making any decisions at this point. Hypothetically, if it, originally this was a sidewalk project. We fixed the sidewalks, period, end of story. Okay. If we had just replaced the sidewalks and did nothing with the parkway, would that have had to, because that would be like status quo of what's there now, would that have to still, would, would the state have required us to do anything at that point because we were doing some, like, like you know, you're, you're enhancing your house and you move it up to code. I'm trying to, is there something similar to that when it comes to the state? If that was how we started? Any, any replacement of materials, a significant replacement of materials, even though we're doing a like-for-like -like replacement, they would want to know what we're doing. Right. Um, but they would be likely, you know, to approve a like-for-like -like replacement. Um, the covenant, restrictive covenant that we have with the state requires that we follow the Secretary of the Interior standards when we're doing alterations or, in this case, a, a re partial rehabilitation or restoration of the uh, beachfront area. And the, the issue is, is that the sidewalk that now extends between the original sidewalk and the curbing, when we take that up, we're going to be doing a small, you probably read that in the report, it's going to be a smaller scoring pattern, I believe nine by nine squares to differentiate it. It's, it's using a, a compatible material. It's going to have the same texture and the same color. But by changing the scoring pattern, what it does is it makes it obvious to the observer that something different happened there at one time, that that's where the planting strip, you know, hopefully they would look and see the planting strip and realize that, oh, gee, that's where the planting strip was. And so that's, that's you know, we have to follow the Secretary of the Interior standards according to that covenant, and the state does review any significant changes that we want to make. Okay, and I guess as we move forward, if there were any slight alterations, that would, what would trigger having to go back to the state or not, we'd have to figure out. Like, yeah, so we, if we took one plant away, would that have to go back to the state? I mean, what, what, what's the, you know, what's, we could, what's we the could make a point? Yeah, We could make a substantial conformance determination if we were doing something that minor. Um, but it, we've already taken quite a bit of the planting strip away. If we were to take more of it away, it's, it's probably going to require that we at least go back to the state and let them know that there's been a change in the plants. Okay. Yeah, I guess the question more is how much more, if, 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 that, if it gets there. I just want to know what the process was. Okay. It gets to be a bit of a sticky wicket when we're trying to make that determination as to where do we trigger, you know, the next level of review. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Well, just so everybody knows, um, I, you have more for your, okay. This uh, council just used 12 min or nine minutes of their time. So just to let you know, I'm being very serious. No, I'm just being very serious because it's part of our procedures. And, uh, okay, staff will continue, and I'll continue counting. Go ahead. Mr. Allen. Thank you, Madam Mayor, member of the City Council. I'm Browning Allen, the Transportation Manager in the Public Works Department. I'm going to discuss with Council the, the issue about lane closure, the operational issues, and how this area currently is operating and the intent behind the red curbing of the area. Uh, the, the curb was painted red by Caltrans uh, back in 1998 when uh, Calle Cesar Chavez was put through to Cabrillo Boulevard. Um, it's painted red simply because we have the left-hand turn lane, which is in this area here, is a protected left for vehicles turning off of Cal uh, Cabrillo Boulevard onto Calle Cesar Chavez. When you look at the, uh, the lane width, we just don't have adequate width in this area here for cars to be parked for any type of length of period of time and have vehicles to you know, pass by. And we need adequately, the space that we need is 20 feet and we only have 15 feet in this, this area. And it jumps up to uh, 16 feet in this general area here. You know, so we're four to five feet short of having a, enough area where we can have cars safely stopping. So that's why it's painted red. That's why we 
have a, a concern about vehicles stopping here. We've looked at um, the, the collision history in this area. It's not great, but we have had some collisions in the area. And, and my staff did the analysis, and basically it started, um, we saw a collision starting right when the, the street was punched through, averaging about two uh, per year. Uh, not a, a big history, but the type of collisions are associated with, one, the volume of traffic on weekends, Saturdays and Sundays, heading out of town, and the, the rear end or side swipe uh, variety, which leads to believe that maybe baby cars are stopped or slowing down in this area. So that's a concern for us. That's why we have really serious concerns about uh, vehicle allowing cars to continue to use this area for loading and unloading. In looking at how can we accommodate this request, we've looked at whether or not we can close a lane. You know, certainly that's something that is doable. We've looked at two scenarios. Um, the first one would be the morning when um, the majority of the members of the arts and crafts show are showing up to set up for the, their day. Um, it's taking up quite a bit of area. This is uh, outlined in the staff report. Here's the red zone. This would be the area where they'd be allowed to load. We need a transition area. It's a long 300-foot area, but you know, we need, need this for proper safety. We follow the manual and uniform traffic control, control devices when we uh, do anything like this. And we need an area where cars can wait you know, for their turn. Also, you know, the vendors or the uh, Arts and Crafts members, when they show up to set up for their, their show and unload the material, uh, they cannot, uh, will not be able to just to stop anywhere in here. If their booth happens, space is in this area here, if they're first in line, you know, they're going to be uh, asked to move towards the end to allow other members of the show to show up to unload. So they're going to have to still uh, travel. Uh, we did meet with the uh, uh, representative of the uh, show on Friday afternoon or Friday morning to discuss this and uh, come up with some different options in terms of the loading. You know, you know, this would be the uh, uh, what we would use in the afternoon if we were to move forward with the uh, loading and unloading in the red zone. It's a shorter area. It doesn't leave a lot of area for the uh, queuing of vehicles. So, you know, some of the vehicles would have to go around the block until it opens up for them to get in. Um, uh, Maryland did talk about well maybe they can uh, be assigned to time. That's something that's an operational thing that would have to be worked out with Parks and Recreation staff. But in this scenario, we would start at the yellow zone, shortening up the queuing area of the transition. Uh, so this area, in this general area, would be for the queuing of the vehicles, and they would be loading in this area here. One thing to uh, mention that if we do this, it cannot impact the number one travel line. We want to keep this free flowing, so vehicles would enter in this general area here, wait their turn to exit out here. We do not want them trying to exit into the, the traffic lane. We just want to prevent any type of um, uh, potential collision in the area. Uh, we ha staff has looked at the possibility of um, maybe reducing some of the red curb. Um, we feel fairly confident that we could probably gain probably another 40 feet in this general area here. That would be enough for uh, two additional cars to unload and load. Um, it, it's something, it's not uh, going to be the catch-all for everybody, but it's, it's, it's something. We've also looked at the possibility of, of shortening the uh, left turn lane, um, but with the uh, waterfront hotel, it's currently under construction, you know, it's going to open, and we want to see how that show is operating and the traffic patterns in the area before we start uh, adjusting the uh, turning lane. We're not sure what the, the volume is going to be in the left turn. Right now it's a low volume, but with the new hotel, we might see an increase in volume in the area. So it's something we want to analyze over a number of uh, months before we make any adjustments to it. But this something is doable. You know, you know, Parks, you know, Parks and Rec staff and myself, we've costed out how much it would it cost, you know, the upfront costs and the ongoing costs if we were to do the lane closure. You know, one-time only cost of, of the equipment. We have to buy a number of cones as well as um, uh, some signs, you know, roughly $5,400. And then the on ongoing costs, you know, Parks and Rec would have to add additional, one, additional, one or two additional staff people and extend the hours that they're working. Um, we prefer to have three people at least initially doing the lane closure, one letting the vehicles in, I uh, can't find the mouse, at the beginning, and then one kind of monitoring the middle and make sure they're moving, and the one letting them out at the, uh, the exit area. Uh, as things get refined over months, then they may be able to cut back on the, the staffing. And that cost for staffing is roughly uh, $12,000 on an annual basis. Yeah. Our recommendation is, however, is to continue with the you know, with using the loading zones. We will look at adding uh, additional loading space. You know, you know, 
our average hourly volume of vehicles heading eastbound, heading out of town is you know, right around 900 vehicles. You know, Sundays, you know, I think everybody knows what Sundays is, especially during the summer months. You know, we see a lot of people getting off of Highway 101 and figuring out a way to get around the bottleneck, and this is one of the ways they do that. So we do see a large volume of vehicles uh, on Cabrillo Boulevard, and so we, this could have an impact on the circulation in this area. And so our recommendation would be to use a uh, loading zone and not stop in the red zone. Uh, but we did uh, lay out the, this option in terms of closing a lane as an option for council to consider. You know, um, Drew Van Hingle, the acting transportation supervising engineer, is in the audience, as well as Charles McChesney, who's the traffic sergeant in the, the police department, if you have any questions about anything we discussed. Okay. Have any interesting questions council might have. Okay, any questions from the council? Okay, anybody else? Are we done? Okay. And Bill, did, did you want to speak on the city behalf or on the staff? And I don't know. <laughs> it's almost... Both, actually. Okay. Well, come on up here. Sure. Sure. Um, Madam Mayor, members of the council, um, no one's told you yet why this is significant. Um, we've just told you it's old and we like it, and, and, and so what? Um, there, there were two people, um, a man named Olmsted and a man named Cheney, who at the turn of the century came up with an idea um, that cities could be beautiful. Um, and they gave New York City the plan for Central Park. They gave San Francisco the inspiration for Golden Gate Park. They gave the Fens in Boston and an awful lot of the shoreline and the parks that encircle Chicago. Um, and they did a plan, a master plan for transportation in Santa Barbara in about the 1920s. It, it, and I've recommended that plan to you, and I hope you've gotten a copy of it, because it's a masterful and very insightful plan as to how to go about designing a city that is good for traffic, good for pedestrians, good for everybody. Um, one of the, 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 the core pieces of their, their planning design and their theory was that pedestrians should be separated from the automobiles then emerging and ought to be separated from the other alternate pieces of transportation at that point still, the horse and carriage. And so the design of Central Park, they have a very ingenious way of, of, of merging all these different elements but always keeping them separated by landscaping. Um, it was done for aesthetic reasons, it's done for safety reasons. Um, you know, back then you'd get soaking wet if you walked down a street edge right on the edge of the curb, and you do today actually if you walk down Cabrillo Boulevard in a rainstorm, if we ever blessed with that again. Mm -hmm. um, but it was, it was an ingenious piece of planning, and, and I think we were blessed with a version of that plan when Cabrillo Boulevard, um, the only part, Cabrillo Boulevard and the, uh, the Bird Refuge, the only parts of that master plan that were really carried out. So that's why it's significant. Um, the, the other part of it is it, it's really quite beautiful, and it's beautiful seven days a week, not just, um, not just on an afternoon on a Sunday. Um, the Landmarks Commission, um, of course, we wanted all of the landscaping back. We wanted it to look like it did in the oldest physical record we have of it, which is the, um, the geranium photograph. Um, the, the master plan that I talked about indicated an even wider expanse of landscaping and a more curvy linear pl uh, plan to Cabrillo Boulevard. That didn't happen. What we have is what happened. Um, so it, it, we were reluctant to give up any bit of landscaping. Um, but, you know, we live in a real world, and there was lots of people sitting there thinking we're going to take their living away from them if we had all this landscaping. So we said, well, we'll begin to compromise. Um, and, and we did, um, and we did, and we did again. And I, I think we're at the point where at least the commission, if it compromised any more, we'd be talking to Shippo about this is no longer, you, we have lost the significant element of this design. And we, couldn't, we wouldn't be able to support the findings that allow this project to go ahead as being consistent with what we need to do for landmark status building. So um, I, I think it's unfortunate we're here today that uh, wanting more paving, I, I think we've gotten, uh, the commission has gotten a lot more paving than we thought we were going to get. Um, but we think the design is um, exemplary. Um, we were very happy with the plant material and the solutions for getting more paving, for getting people in and out of cars, thinking it was an ingenious solution that solved both problems. So okay. um, we uh, hope you 
deny the appeal. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you. And now it's the appellant's turn. And who's going to speak for the appellant? Alan? Okay. You filled out a speaker slip, so. But you didn't need to, but that's okay. Oh, uh, that's I, I all right. Speak in public comment, too, or not? I don't know if I can. Um, <clears throat> Let's keep our fingers crossed. Okay. This works. Deborah. Okay. Oh, interesting. Okay. Click on the logo. Madam Mayor and esteemed members of the council. Thank you. As soon as I figure out how to turn this on. No, there's a little on? clicker somewhere. Is it I on can't now? tell. There's a little button on the side. I have a button on the top. Is that correct? Okay. Now it's on. Yeah. Great. Um, this is my first um, keynote presentation here, so. There's usually something second. on the lower left that you click on this. Yeah, yeah. Right. I, I have to go to inspector. No, slideshow. <laughs> We're all going to help her. Oh, boy. Isn't it? Oh, it's my, no, you know, I'm sorry. I had to change my, I remember, I'm sorry. Uh, just bear with me for one second. Displays. It's. Display has to go to 1024 by 680. By 760. Okay. Sorry for the. Thank you. Okay. Is it going to be stretched? Did it stretched? I thought it was in the lower left. They click on slideshow. It's stretched, I think, a little bit. We'll have to live with it. Okay. It's stretching it, but I'll, maybe I can figure it out in the interim. But it looks okay there. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Thank you once again. Sorry for the trouble. I, okay. This is my first time ever doing it. Okay. Um, first of all, um, members of the Santa Barbara Arts and Crafts Show, it's a little difficult. I guess I can't look at you and operate this at the same time. So. Um, we would like to thank you very much for this opportunity to appeal the sidewalk project. And we'd like you all to know that we take it very seriously. And we understand the constraints of the project. We absolutely appreciate the efforts that all of you have made on our behalf to understand the situation. And um, with that, I'll proceed with this little project here, which will work in a second, I promise. Come on. Okay. So there's our thank you. And let us say at the outset that we are indeed, we are united in our desire to see the sidewalks replaced in spite of what emails you may have received in the past day or so, as we ourselves have been advocating this position since the late 1980s. At issue still remains the need to move the access paths from eight, set back from 18 inches to 27 inches from the inside edge of the curb, remove the planting from between the light posts, and to provide loading and unloading measures via lane closure for persons situated in the red zone in the second half of the craft section. These images from the late 1800s depict Santa Barbara's waterfront environs. Although predominantly of the West Beach area, they are reflective of the community's desire to maintain a promenade character in the waterfront area. However, most of the beachfront area east of Stearns Wharf was privately owned by various businesses and homeowners, including a lumber yard east of Stearns Wharf, thus preventing the contiguous shoreline promenade from West Beach to East, east to be realized. It wasn't until the early 1920s that most but not all of the private beachside property was acquired by the city, which allowed a public vision of the waterfront to be included in the 1924 Cheney Olmsted design. This plan provided a goal of a continuous boulevard to be built to connect two distinctly different parkland areas together, the Bird Refuge and what is now 
considered Shoreline Park and beyond. City planners were driven by the advent of the automobile to plan around the newer mode of transportation. Newer definitions of streets, boulevards, and highway width were developed to meet the demands of motorized transportation. They enlisted the services of, of Charles Cheney and the Olmsted Brothers firm, which was headed by the son of Frederick Law Olmsted, designer of Central Park, who died in 1903. Their father understood that he was planning for the future. He also realized that populations would double over and over again and planned accordingly. Finally, his parks were his best studies of democracy. Many wonderful things have been said about Frederick Olmsted, but what is most pertinent to our discussion today is what contemporary scholars say about his legacy 150 years later. The genius of Olmsted was that he did these large things. He gave structure to the city so it couldn't be changed easily. Then he accepted that it would be infilled by commercial forces. He laid out the big parks and parkways and then let people follow their own course. He understood that you couldn't regulate that. He continues, and democracy is its soul. Certainly his intention was to create an equalizing meeting place where everybody rubs shoulders. Yeah, jogging moms, pushing baby carriages, inline skaters, if Olmsted could see us now. So does the freezing of Olmsted's design into landmark status. This is not to suggest that his parks don't deserve landmark protection, only the freezing them misrepresents Olmsted's way of thinking. For him, a park was a hypothesis, an experiment in democracy. More than a father of landscape design, he was the ancestor of urbanists today who are reckoning with ecology, suburban development, transportation systems, and the use of design as an instrument on behalf of social welfare. As Jean Gardner, an environmentalist trained as an Olmsted scholar, observed, what could be worse for a visionary than to be turned into something that holds back the future? The closest, closest example we have here in Santa Barbara of a sister plan of Olmsted's would be South Park in Chicago. I think it's important to note that Olmsted planned his parks according to the topography of the area that he was taking on. He didn't have one formula park for every park. Their Olmsted was dealing with two distinctly different park areas linked by a 600 foot wide strip. The unifying element to the motif of South Park was water. Making the best of the flat open site, they turned the rest of the inland park into an immense meadow, the South Open Green, also used for parades and athletic events. This area is very much like the scenario envisioned for the Santa Barbara Waterfront area. One contiguous road joining the Bird Refuge with Shoreline Park, with our Chase Palm Park rectangle linking the, linking the two, a park used for sport, athletic events, parades, and the Santa Barbara Arts and Crafts Show. One of the commissioners examining the plans for the South Open Meadow said, I don't see Mr. Olmsted, but the plans indicate any flower beds in the park environs. Now where would you recommend they be placed? Olmsted promptly replied, anywhere outside the park. Mm. No, no, no. What interested Olmsted was not the different vegetation, nor even the general appearance of topical scenery, but the emotion it aroused in him. If my retrospective analysis of this emotion is correct, it rests upon the childish playfulness of nature. This was in regards to this South Park rectangle. It was this playfulness that he wanted to achieve at South Park in the area akin to our Chase Palm Park. The master plan for Santa Barbara was adopted in 1924, entitled Major Traffic Street Plan, Boulevard and Park System. Regarding East Cabrillo Boulevard, the ocean side of the plan called for the acquisition of the lumber yard, the setback of the boulevard away from the ocean, and construction of a berm planted with appropriate species to offset the washouts from the periodic storms and straightening it to bring it closer to the water. They talk on the north side east of Garden Street of putting in a dignified sidewalk and for a line of trees next to the curb, continuous with the rather dignified and notable row of palms. And on the ocean side, from the west of South Sequoia Street to Milpas, a sidewalk or narrow paved promenade on the shoreward side of the road. The planners understood the limita limitations of park treatment on the beachside areas due to storms, washout, and natural topography, and recommended that the city offset this by acquiring land on the north side of the boulevard for shade trees and other decorative elements. 
There's no discussion around the design of the sidewalk on the beach side at Cabrillo Boulevard in the report, but it does specify the width of the sidewalk to be 20 feet, a nod to Olmstead's love for promenades. Nor does it specify what plants are to be used. It only calls for appropriate species to protect the berms. This is an overhead of the plan. This is a closer up. This is basically the region where we're talking about. And if you can read it, it also calls for a subway to go under, <laughs> underneath. It's very interesting. This is a, a slice, if you, it, for lack of a better description. And then if we zero in on the slice, the area to your left that's cut off would be the ocean and then the sand and then the, the berm. What we now have is the grass. Proposed sidewalk of 20 feet and then a new road and then park and planting on the north side. Then he has the original road up there. Of importance to us in this discussion is the sectional diagram. Just as I've described, I'll, I'll forward on. And then there's another, another picture of it. Nowhere does he show any planting between the road and the roadside edge of the sidewalk. And then the plants on the other side are mostly uh, berm protecting plants, low ground cover. In the early 1940s during World War II, East Cabrillo Boulevard is actually used for tent encampments. Dwight Murphy Field is a military headquarter. In the 50s comes the desire to revitalize the area. 1965, the birth of the Santa Barbara Arts and Crafts Show, our show now in its 42nd year becoming one of the most valuable cultural resources to the city of Santa Barbara and one of the most loved. To summarize, the desire to have a promenade, the boulevard is meant to separate passenger cars from trucks and commercial vehicles. That boulevard later becomes a state highway, thus changing even the Cheney Olmstead classification. The boulevard in and of itself holds portions which are fully paved to the curb of sidewalk providing evidence for the wide promenades that Olmsted so favored. Some of these widened sidewalks are within the arts and crafts show boundaries. We are comprised of 90 artists and 190 craftspeople at full capacity. We're the oldest continuous art show in the country. Many of our members have achieved the highest level of honor in their fields. And as a result of the construction of the left hand turn lane, the second half of the craft section has lost all access to public parking on the beachside area of Cabrillo. We've gone from a full show of 190 artisans to watching our numbers decline by 60 due to this loss of parking. About the show. Who we are. This work is the sisters. I am always amazed they paint these faces, faces with a brush that's one bristle. And unfortunately, I couldn't put any music to this. So. <laughs> David Sugich making kaleidoscopes. This is fused glass by Jill Whitmore. Many of us are members of the Yes Store now in our 39th year. These are woodcuts of, by John Rinlob of the area that we're talking about right now. Most of us are full-time artists and artisans, meaning that we are self-supporting from our own art or craft. 
All of us will be affected in some negative way by the upcoming construction projects slated for the next four years. The giant looming ahead is the replacement of Mission Bridge and the Fest Parker Hotel to the east. Secondary, the replacement of sidewalks on the beach side of Cabrillo Boulevard. Our show has never rebounded from the rerouting of Highway 101 and the construction of Paseo Nuevo. In fact, we've lost at least 50% of visitor traffic permanently. We are requesting you uphold the, the appeal based on the standpoint of process. Regarding CEQA and historic clearance guidelines, we were never adequately given the opportunity to <coughs> review the project within the CEQA guidelines, nor were we notified of the review period or the negative declaration in a timely manner. There's still conflicting information whether or not ERR requirements and coastal review are required. We were never properly notified of time and date of the submission of the historic structures clearance report, so we didn't have the opportunity for public comment on that. Very early we offered the services of a departing Arts and Crafts Show committee member to be the liaison and we were refused. Sometime in 2005, we made a motion calling for a planning session at no cost to all city parties involved so that we wouldn't end up where we are today and that offer was refused. The maps and plans we received initially were poor quality and there was confusion to the very end that the planting strips in between the light posts were not themselves just light post planning strips. And that was mainly due to the space numbers being absent from the map and until the space numbers showed up on the map, which was almost three years later, took two and a half years later to get our space numbers. Uh, we had no idea of uh, scale or the, the impact of this plan. So we actually had to go out and mark all the space numbers and, and do a parking study and that's why we came to you so late. Without the space numbers, we could not have any idea of the impacts. Um, we also ask that you uphold our appeal based on the following findings. Again, process. CEQA, which talks about you have option, options of four treatment approaches to this area. Um, ADA guidelines, according to the several people who are handicapped in our show, uh, their research indicates ADA guidelines are not being met. Local coastal plan issues of limiting public's access to the beach. The fact that the San Barbara Arts and Crafts Show itself is a valuable cultural resource to the community and that you own it. Increased city budget and increased demand on an already limited water supply. The plant palette chosen in certain sections is not compatible with use in the area. The plan as it approved today is not working for the users and that the appeal itself was rushed from January 29th, moved up to December 11th. Finally, that in spite of the goodwill extended to the show, we must be seen as a more important cultural resource to the city as previously stated, and as such, must be protected from the negative impacts of any construction. Lastly, part of the charter of the redevelopment agency is not to cause economic blight to any existing business in the area in the process of reversing physical blight in an area. That is to say that the prevention of any cause of economic demise or hardship to an existing party or parties, such as this Arts and Crafts Show or its members, supersedes any visual, environmental, and aesthetic blight in the area. Certain aspects of this plan will cause economic and business hardship, and therefore needs must take precedence according to the redevelopment charter. We should be seen as an intricate part of the community and not just an aside and the on-site effects of the proposed plans. I'm going to hope this works. I'm just going to load this. Okay. For some reason, it just didn't want to load. Purple mushroom. What we haven't seen in the discussion of these plans is what the planting scenarios are going to look like how far they're going to reach out, and the impacts that they're going to have. Um, we have, I forget the exact number of vehicles, um, but half, I think it's approximately half of the parking in the gray area will be affected in this manner. The front car will be blocked and the back car will be blocked from the front and the side. Certainly this is a beautiful planting 
It can be accomplished and achieved easily. It doesn't violate Olmsted's vision of having a beautiful planted area along the promenade. And you know, let's remember that promenade was his, his big thing. And if we scale back the planting around the lampposts, and we could go out to three feet in each direction. If you scale back the planting, both vehicles can be accessed and we can all go home happy. There's the initial site. There's the proposed, <laughs> excuse the photo <laughs> face stuff. There's a, a second vision. That's what could work. Then we can all go home happy. So we could have option one or option two. And in the photographing of various plantings around the city today, I saw numerous, numerous examples of this working. So once again, access to both vehicles blocked. And this happens everywhere along the way. The other reason space numbers were so critical is with the plans that we had before the space numbers were on them, um, it looked like it was 15 or 20 cars before they were affected. And once the space numbers were on and I drew the map out to scale, then you could see that it was two cars affected, then two cars not, then two cars affected. So that gives you a visual there. And then finally, I have more there, but I'm going to fast track up to this. Um, OK. What's this one? Okay, that's the f this is stretched. That's too bad. I'm not going to be able to fix this. Here is a before. This is an example. Let's start it again. Of a crafts person loading and unloading unobstructed. This particular individual will have 12 feet of planting in front of her vehicle, which will block her entire vehicle. The entire side, the planting begins to the left of the pail and goes up almost to her front door. We probably make 30 to 40 trips back and forth in the morning and then in the evening. It's almost everything we carry is an individual carry. This is why we had hoped to have a site visit while the show was ongoing. And I do thank those members of the council who made an effort to come down and educate themselves. It's really hard work. This is a 35 pound case, glass case. And you can see, of course, the straightest path to the vehicle is so important. I'm sorry, I couldn't edit that out. And then this is, again, why rear and side access is so important. So again, this is, this is the ability to load and load unencumbered. And the other thing to keep in mind is there's a plant, when, when we did the site visit on Monday, yesterday, there's a light post on each side and a planting in the middle. So between each light post span, there's actually three planted areas, not one when you look at just the one planter. So that's before. This is an after. And I, I'm sorry for the mock-up, but the, the, these are four-foot boxes uh, shown to indicate uh, what the planting scenario would be, and they're set back the 18 inches plus the 6 inches from the curb. We did a study. We invited several people to view it, and we said on last Friday we could deal with 27 inches set back from the curb, adding 6 inches of the curb. Right now we're running into um, OSHA situations here where suddenly the workplace is no longer safe, we're twisting and turning, we're throwing our backs out, we're tripping off a curb. <coughs> and, and it just seems that to place plants above people in a situation where it's not an endangered species is just a crime. Um, we carry heavy items and they're bulky and there's a lot of twisting and turning and the last thing you want to be doing is twisting and turning in this area. I'm going to fast.
fast forward this to this is the example that you saw earlier with the area planted in in the photos this is what it would look like front and side access blocked on this vehicle and then oh sorry oh well, I guess we're going to go to this I have something important there. If I can find it, I will. And then the final film is, um, this is today. I hope you can excuse my appearance, but um, we went out early this morning along State Street, and we tried to load and load under various, uh, alongside various planting strips. I'd like you to know that we respected the 18 inches plus the 6 inches and added a few more as though we were parked along the curb. This is a planted strip in front of 530 State Street showing the rebar that and the fencing that's going to be there um, for, we think, a year or a little less. And we carry, as I say, I kid you not, probably 30 different loads. I think it's important to state that I am not affected by the proposed plans but I'm speaking as an advocate of the show, so I'm using myself as a, a model for, for what we deal with. This is <laughs> the route now that one would have to take to reach their space. It's six and a half feet, then another two, then another six and a half, a twist and a turn, just to get where you're used to, and then tangling on the, and I'm not, uh, I really, tried to do an absolutely honest rendition. Now this is alongside this climbing aloe. The reason I photographed this is this is one of the species proposed and some of the species are really going to be non-compatible with what we do down there. And um, this is all along the red. A lot of the red will have that. Again a lot of side carry twisting. Okay, you have five minutes left. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I'll save the five for rebuttal. Oh. I'll say that um, we did meet on Friday and that I felt we had had some sort of resolution worked out, but I'm not hearing it today. Um, that we can function with just a slightly further setback from the curb. And that the final thing is that um, this plan that nobody's talking about either adds $63,000 to the budget, coupled with the net loss of our permit fees is another 30000 so it's almost a $100,000 cost if you really focus on maintaining this red zone as a defensive planting. Um, and that our hope and goal is to revitalize the show. And the parking estimates are based on a full show. They're not erroneous. It's in the city's interest to sell those permits. And that I want to hand in as an exhibit the actual and factual planting, I mean, parking scenario here so that you see the actual cars that are affected and how parking is affected. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. You have four minutes left, so that works. Okay. Um, now we go to the applicant. Madam Mayor, I have a question for the um, for the appellant, if I may. Shoot. Be brief. Okay. Um, uh, Ms. Laperfido, oh. a, a question for you. Um, the um, it, On Friday, when you met with staff, you talked about a two-foot walk between the 12-foot planters that are be at midpoint between the two uh, things. You didn't mention that today, and you um, also um, uh, didn't comment on the smaller of the two loading zone proposals that, that uh, Mr. Allen had mentioned. So uh, could you just give us, uh, just in a word or two, your take on those two possibilities where the 12-foot planting strip would remain but with a two-foot wide walkway through it, and the other would be uh, the smaller of the two uh, unloading zone options? Thank you. Um, we did speak about the loading and unloading. I can't remember when it was. Uh, it, it sounded like that was something procedural that we could work out. And with the, the shorter version, with the afternoon version being used in the morning and the afternoon so that we would not 
take the large version of loading and unloading. And then the two-foot walkway, we weren't hearing anything today that mentioned that we might consider that, and so that was why I left the original request that we had. We would be open to a two-foot walkway, but the goal was to not have any planting between the light posts. I understand that. Mm -hmm. And then the um, amount of time that would be needed for loading and unloading in the morning and the evening, is that for long duration or is it for, is it for like three hours or is it for an hour or for what, how much time is it? For the lane closure area? That's right. In the uh, morning and in the evening. It still remains to be seen, but I, I think we could do it in a shorter rather than a longer amount of time. It, well, I mean, are we talking about an hour or 20 minutes? I think we're talking an hour, hour and a half. In the morning and an hour, an hour and a half right. in the afternoon. Oh. Right. And, and certainly would be happy to make it as agreeable as possible. Um, okay. On to the applicant, please. Uh, good evening, Madam Mayor, uh, Council Members. Mark Aguilar, City of Santa Barbara Redevelopment Agency. Okay. The applicant for this um, this difficult project. Um, a lot of my thunder's already been stolen, but that's good for you because that means I can go faster, uh, but I might have some nice pictures for you to look at. This is the extent of the project area. Uh, it's roughly about a mile of sidewalk. The origin and funding, questions were already asked earlier. Uh, special meeting back in 2005, and funds came from a bond issue. Uh, some of you were in this room and you remember uh, this project right there where we allocated 3.1 million. <laughs> <laughs> um, the existing conditions, uh, you've seen a number of slides. This is typical. Uh, again, more. What you're seeing here is uh, almost a continuous strip of potentially plantable area uh, between the area of Garden Street and Milpas. It's about 4,200 lineal feet. Uh, our project is proposing about 1,900 lineal feet, so a reduction of lineal footage of about 55%. Uh, this is a seagull view, a very strong, high-flying seagull, and that demonstrates a lot of the patchwork that's out there now, right. one of the reasons why you asked us to move forward with this project. The goals, replace the sidewalk without expansion. Uh, as uh, Council Member Schneider said, uh, this was supposed to be replace the sidewalk, get it done. But we also had to reestablish some landscaping, improve the design to better accommodate the contemporary uses, uh, that is uh, the, primarily the arts and crafts show on the weekend, uh, and the high pedestrian volumes on, on those two days, as well as um, the community visiting during the week and stopping to play soccer and have lunch. And also to preserve the historic character of this uh, district. The project description I will skip through because it's been discussed uh, by Mr. Limon. Uh, we are co coordinating with the Mission Creek Bridge construction project. So while our original project was originally going to start at State Street, uh, we'll probably be starting closer to Anacapa, Helena area, and moving eastward to Milpas. Uh, when the bridge is constructed, they will finish off the segment of sidewalk that we haven't. Uh, Reestablishing some landscaping. Um, again, the landscaping extends presently, or the plantable strips, there is no actual landscaping right now, uh, between Garden Street and Milpas. And this is kind of what you see, and I'm not sure how to explain the diagonal lines you're seeing. Um, I think we had some issue earlier with uh, one of the other machines on at the same time. Uh, maybe uh, IS can respond to this. Uh, but you'll see uh, those plantable areas right now are almost continuous, and this is one typical segment. Uh, parkway, hardscape, and landscape changes of this project. Uh, presently, there's approximately 18,000 square feet of existing planting area. We are proposing 7,000 square feet of planting area, uh, so there's a net change of new hardscape of 11,000 square feet. And we think that was a, sig a significant change uh, to uh, this existing design. And to upgrade the pedestrian amenities was also a goal, and that would include uh, taking out those uh, stone aggregate uh, trash can containers and the plastic recycling bins and replacing them with a single dual purpose can like you see on Coast Village Road, uh, and adding uh, some benches in there as well. We really thought at the beginning this was going to be a very simple sidewalk project. But some design issues emerged. Thank you all. Uh, one was the reestablishment of appropriate landscaping. Because of the high pedestrian volumes, uh, you know, we had to come up with a, a plant palette that was going to be durable. We had our historians, our landscape architects, cons uh, consultants, um, parks and recreation department staff sit down in a room together with the question posed essentially, 
how can we design this given the, the constraints with the high pedestrian volumes? How can we make it defensible to some degree um, given that it's very open? Uh, we have to be compliant with the city's policies for uh, water conservation, integrated pest management, maintenance uh, concerns, man hours, as well as uh, cost to the Parks and Recreation Department. And uh, we think we, we developed and evolved a very good design. We consider the arts and craft show as part of this discussion. Uh, they've been in this location for 40 plus years and they are, uh, you know, they are a positive influence in the community. How can we uh, approach this project and still accommodate this contemporary use that was not envisioned uh, in the 1920s when this was designed? Um, the loading and unloading operations they've described, and you probably have seen on the weekends, uh, it's typical that um, uh, an artisan will, will pull up as close as they can to their assigned spot and, and unload their, their items directly, because straighter is better, uh, to their spot and, and do that again in the afternoon. So we recognize that. Um, we recognize that parking near their space is preferred and that there's been an issue already discussed about um, parking temporarily in the red zone at the Calle Cesar Chavez intersection. I won't elaborate further on that. And then naturally the high pedestrian traffic during the show, um, which we're all familiar with. Then the East Cabrillo Boulevard Historic District, uh, also a significant element in all of this design. Um, again, it was the 1924 Olmsted Brothers Charles Cheney design uh, that Ms. LaPerfido uh, was showed a very good picture of in her presentation. Sidewalk was constructed in 1928, as best we can tell. Uh, we had the same const uh, contractor stamps in that sidewalk as we do on the Mission Creek Bridge, so it's kind of interesting that they're both being uh, up for replacement at just about exactly the same time. Uh, historic district designation in 1992 at the state level, uh, not at the local level, and the 1995 relinquishment agreement Mr. Limon has alluded to and described. The state does retain some oversight uh, and the city has agreed to protect the district. A historic structure report was repaired, prepared at the request of the Historic Landmarks Commission and this was asked for very early on. Uh, it was accepted by the HLC as well as uh, SHPO. There were a number of uh, issues raised in the appeal. Um, in your council packet, um, our historical consultants, Post Hazel Tyne, have included two letters responding in the first letter dated 1116 uh, of this year to specific issues in the appeal letter. And then subsequently, a few days later, an additional letter that um, redevelopment agency staff asked for to help clarify matters a little bit further about, you know, what could could change in the design as it is now? What could be considered and be up for discussion before they would have an opportunity to view another plan perhaps and, and assess it again at that time? Um, but any design changes would require further assessment of the effects on the district. So our design issues uh, required that we balance a number of elements. Hardscape and landscape, almost you know, essentially diametrically opposed. The historic design and aesthetics with contemporary uses in high pedestrian volume maintenance, IPM, and the city's water conservation policies. And uh, we believe uh, that design does address these elements uh, very successfully. The approved design, um, again, same slide you saw before. Here's what exists now, an almost continuous strip of plantable area. What we're proposing is something pretty different. Um, what you see on the left and right there are light posts. And to either side of each light post is roughly seven to seven and a half feet of landscaping. So it's a 15 foot stretch. Between those light posts, we're proposing a 12 foot stretch of landscaping. The light posts themselves average a distance of about 130 feet. It varies somewhere between 125 and 150, but 130 is about the average. This is another uh, image just showing, uh, if you look closely, um, what we've done is We've introduced uh, some hardscaping here, which wasn't originally in our, our early design, uh, but this was to accommodate people getting out of their cars and, and unloading and loading to the, the degree that we can, given the large reduction in uh, plantable area. And in certain instances where um, we're near a red zone or some other obstruction, uh, we've also uh, tried to leave the area clear. This is a little bit of a close-up showing the dimensions. Uh, Here's one light post, uh, roughly uh, 65 feet down the way, uh, centered here is a 12 foot strip and then you would see another light post 65 feet off to the left. 
the landscape strips are three feet wide here, and that's with the 18-inch additional hardscape. So with the uh, six-inch curb and the 18 inches, there's two feet of hardscape now. So that offers people the option to not have to step into mud or dirt when they get out of their cars. Um, a further reduction of the width of this landscaping here uh, really starts to impact uh, the visual view of, of the strip that we're trying to provide. Again, a little bit more of the same. In areas where no parking is uh, anticipated, no loading or unloading in the red zone, we've kept the landscape at the full width. Again, uh, this is essentially, in essence, what we're, we're proposing. Um, I, re I won't reiterate these numbers. There's a big uh, change in the amount of plantable area and a large increase in hardscape. Um, but here are the details. Uh, full width parkways, about four and a half feet in the no parking zones. Narrower planting areas, three feet in no parking zones that might still be utilized for unloading and loading. Uh, we've provided seven hardscape gaps of 20 feet along Calle Cesar Chavez no parking zone to allow uh, some type of queued up parking with the lane closure. Narrow planting areas, uh, three feet in parking zones, again to accommodate just the rest of the community. Uh, planters would be 24 inches away from the curb face. And we also have a video clip here uh, that uh, park staff can narrate a bit. We'll return to my program in just a moment. Okay, I'm just going to show you a few brief moments of a video created to simulate loading and unloading. Okay, this is Judith Cook from our Parks Department. Um, what we tried to do was simulate the loading and unloading, and although we realized that each Arts and Crafts and Hope member has a, di a different size display and sells different sizes and shapes of items. Um, we tried to show this using some weighted boxes and uh, using some heavy tables. Um, just to give you a layout here, the stakes and the yellow caution tape represent um, the 15 feet of landscaping around the light post here. It's part of this proposed plan. Um, in this example, hardscape would fill the parkway from the foreground of this video all the way up to the stakes. So that would all be hardscape. And as you can see, the gentleman there is walking down um, the 24-inch strip, which is the six, uh, feet, uh, six inches of curb and then the 18 inches of hardscape that would be added there. We'll wait a second here and see if he'll get something, a table out of there. And then we'll uh, move on to Mark. Nope. Mark's uh, <laughs> He's got lots of buckets. <laughs> Maybe he's selling buckets. <laughs> lots of recycling containers. Can you point out how far the trellis uh, extends beyond the pole? or Because it circles the pole all the way around, doesn't it? Um, Madam Mayor, Council Member House, uh, it's about six inches uh, away from the pole. So it would be, at that point, a closer to where this gentleman is standing in the video. So he'd be bumping into it right now. All right, I'm back on, but I'm going <clears> to <throat> speed through this. Don't get dizzy. Design. All right. 
we're back. Uh, so uh, at the light poles, uh, we have 15 foot long parkways. I'm at the second bullet to the end, uh, six feet on both sides of the light pole, but the light pole base itself is a foot and a half or so. And then between the light poles, uh, one 12 foot long parkway. Um, our review process, and this is a partial summary, um, attachment four in your council report has the, the full listing. But just briefly, uh, we started this process very late in 2004 and we took, we basically went with a blank slate to the Parks and Recreation Commission and the Historic Landmarks Commission and said, hey, we're going to do the sidewalk project. What are your concerns? Do you have anything? And uh, immediately, uh, we kind of had a, a, a deviation of, of goals. Um, uh, HLC being charged with aesthetics and historic preservation, uh, their priorities were a little bit from than parks were for maintenance and, and, uh, and the arts and crafts show. Uh, so we pulled them together in a joint work session. We thought it'd be best to do that rather than ping pong back and forth. And uh, that helped. Uh, we continued on through this process and it really wasn't until about a year and a half after our start, so mid-06, where we kind of got the two commissions, maybe not necessarily in the same ballpark, but in the same parking lot that the ballpark was in. <laughs> At that point, we felt now that we were, we were kind of almost talking the same language, we could bring this uh, design forward or, or the idea forward to the public. In this case, it was the, uh, the arts and crafts show. So in that, it's been, it was a while before they saw that. That is absolutely correct, but there's, there's a basis for that. Uh, we moved through the project uh, with a lot of review and we received our final approval in September of this year. Uh, the project received environmental review in the form of an exemption under CEQA section 15302 for replacement of existing facilities with no expansion of capacity uh, as listed in our goals for the project. The coastal review, uh, we received a coastal exemption for repair maintenance activity not resulting in enlargement or expansion and, and importantly and which does not involve the risk of adverse environmental Im impact and that's where the historic structures report came in as a, as a very important document. So, in summary, we feel that, uh, you know, there, are, there were a lot of elements to balance in this project, as, as you've seen, uh, definitely uh, concerns by the arts and crafts show, and we fully acknowledge that. Uh, we're a little bit more constrained, and we were looking out for, as well, the aesthetic requirements uh, that we wanted to maintain the district, preserve it. Uh, we wanted to uh, come up with a design that served the community as a whole on other days uh, out of the week as well, and um, I would say, I think this design is, is, is a very good design. Um, thank you. Um, staff is here to answer any questions you have. Okay. Thank you very much. And um, I guess there's nothing else. I'm, you've got 10 minutes left from the staff presentation, which is <laughs> not you, but yeah, as the, um, as the applicant. So just to let you know. Okay. Um, public. Questions? Yes, they come out of your time, but go ahead. I'm just telling you. <laughs> I had, uh, Mark, I had two quick questions. D depending on where the, the assigned spot is for the artists, I'm still not quite clear. Could they? Could some people park directly in front of their spot, load across the hardscape, and so they really wouldn't be any change, but others would have to park, walk, what, six feet over and then back six feet? Is that is that the thing? So are we talking about 12 extra feet of walking? Madam Mayor, Council Member Horton, um, if you, uh, on the slide there, if, if one were to park uh, directly, um, and I would advise against that, but if, you're, if your door were here, and, right. and that might be the case, uh, because you know, someone might have a spot right here, and, and a lot of the cars park you know, trunk to tail, essentially, right. on, on the morning. But yes, uh, rather, you know, if you could avoid it, you would try not to park right in the center of this, this strip. You know, even a foot either way reduces your walking distance by 30 Yeah, so, 30%. so is the worst possible then 12? Is that uh, what we're saying? Correct. Six feet one way and then six feet back okay. the other way to continue. The second question dealt with the, there was a criticism about the landscape that was selected. Is the landscape architect here maybe? Yes, yes sir. It, is there any comment uh, on that? Or? Is it Mr. Cunningham? Mr. Cunningham? Cunningham? I assume it's Mr. Cunningham. <laughs> Let me, yeah, that's on. Uh, good there evening, go. Madam Chair, members of the uh, council. Um, they, we, I'm Bob Cunningham, landscape architect. We, uh, met with parks staff and uh, 
went through a rather painstaking process to select the plants that we felt were the most appropriate. Um, these plants are uh, extremely drought tolerant, California natives, Mediterranean exotics suited to this climate. We do have an irrigation system because we need to establish the plants. However, they should all be able to survive without supplemental irrigation after establishment. Uh, we don't pretend that they'll be able to withstand pedestrian traffic, but it's, it's probably the most sustainable landscape possible under the conditions. Can I just ask real quickly, you've, you've uh, survived the State Street parades and all that with your landscape, because the landscape that you've put in all along the uh, State Street, is there anything that you would um, recommend since you have an opportunity, maybe you've already done that, um, for people who don't think that a plant is landscape or something, I don't know, I just see them standing right on top of some of the plants you put in when they're watching a parade. And I can see down at the Arts and Crafts show them walking right through it. So is there anything to avoid that? Um, this has baffled me for 40 years. So okay. <laughs> so I really haven't got a solution for that. Okay. People are people, I guess, huh? Okay. Thanks. Did you have a question? M Madam Chair, if I might. Yeah. Madam okay. Chair, Agency Board yeah. Member Horton. I, I also want to... Um, in, in regards to the landscape that's being proposed by Mr. Cunningham as part of this project, I also want to let you know that where we do have landscape on the other side of Stearns Wharf as part of the West Beach Pedestrian Improvement Project, um, we have essentially poached on um, the, the pallet that's being proposed on West Beach and are carrying that over where there are plantings. Granted, um, it's a much different project, but we are continuing that flow throughout the, okay. the waterfront. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Falcone. Oh, so the Mr. landscaping House. will be will be um, consistent throughout the entire walk of the waterfront from the bathhouse to the bathhouse. Madam Mayor. At least the types of plantings you're talking about. That is correct. Okay. Now, to follow up on Mr. Horton's question, um, in the picture that we're looking at, there are, I can't even count how many spaces for artists, uh, the little medallions that, yeah, that you're pointing to right now, mm -hmm. there are many there. Under the best of circumstances, uh, with no, even with no obstructions, there are how many parking spaces available in that particular run of sidewalk? I would submit that there are not even half of the parking spaces available than there are artists' booths. So someone somewhere along the line is going to get a space in front of their table and three or four people in that same row of, of uh, folks are not. So what happens to those folks now and where are they parking? Because clearly there's Ms. nowhere Ms. near enough spaces for those folks. So the idea of parking right in front of your table, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of uh, give and take for that right now. I mean, the calculations on that are correct, right? Ms. Cook, uh, Mayor Blumen, Council Member Falcone, just a point of clarification. Each one of those numbers you there that you see there uh, each, between each one of those dots is a five-foot increment, basically five feet. So those dots do not uh, denote an, an individual show member. So show members have spaces that range from 10 feet up to 20 feet. Uh, in each area is different. They're all mixed up. So not uh, being able to tell what area this is, um, you know, a combination of three, two to three to four of those dots would represent one person. All right, but, but is the premise correct that not everyone gets to park directly in front of their space? Yes, that's true. Okay, Mr. House. Oh, <laughs> okay, good. Um, fine, now we go on to the public. Let me turn that back on. And we'll start with um, Deborah Healy. And we usually have two minutes. That's what we shoot for. Am I able to defer my minutes to someone else? We don't usually play yes. that kind of game, but if you want to, go ahead. It doesn't matter. Some of us are shy. Well, then let me go. Let me go ahead and call the other people then, and and then you can okay. talk at the end if you want to do that. Good evening. Oh, never mind. Um, Madam Mayor <laughs> and City Council, thank you. Um, as the chairperson for the advisory board for the arts and craft show, um, I'm speaking in behalf of all the members which um, we are elected to represent. 
And um, I think that a very simple solution is a um, planting around the lamppost. It goes up. It's colorful. It's pretty. And um, pavers. So not just for the arts and crafts show, but for seven days a week, the use down at the park needs access. The key element for the park should be access. Um, I think that um, I love history, but from history we should learn to make met better decisions for now and for the future. It's today's park, not yesterday's park, and, what, um, and it also has to be a park that will work for the future. Um, I think I'd like to point out that when we saw the example of someone unloading their car um, that, uh, with, the, with the empty pails or full pails, whatever they were, he was parked probably 18 inches from the curb. So once you park, so really a car door does not take two feet to open. We keep talking about the, the two foot, counting the 18 and the six. A car door takes at least three. So now, you're, now most people... All during the week, everyone, mothers, children, uh, children, strollers, bicycles, um, are 18 inches further out into the street to be able to really open their car door. And I wonder about the safety issue on the other side, getting out of the driver's side. You're now further out into the street. You've got to step down over a curb. I just feel that um, uh, safety is an issue, and we really can make this work for all of us and for the members of the community seven days a week by putting um, planting around the lamppost. I was just in Central Park two days ago strolling, and I noticed that um, cobblestones were used for pavers, and there were small plantings around the tree. I watched cars pull up, unload children, go to the Museum of Natural History, and... Um, it was very accessible, um, no obstacles. And I hope that we can do that here in Santa Barbara, too. Thank you. Thank you. Lori Lehman will be followed by Dawn Williams. Hmm? Uh, good evening, and thank you um, all for taking a moment or some time out to consider our cause here. Can you pull the microphone up to me? I'm sorry. You are I'm you sorry. the model from the film? <laughs> yeah. You look familiar. <laughs> um, I would like to begin just by thanking you for um, giving your time this evening. Um, I have lived in Santa Barbara since 1960, and I have been a member of the Art and Craft Show for 28 years. During this time, it has been my... Um, is very close to me. It's been my whole, uh, my entire livelihood. Um, I have seen many changes here, most with the community's uh, benefit and beautification in mind. Um, the Cabrillo Sidewalk Project should be no exception to these criteria. There are several points that I would like to comment on. The first being um, the features of the project, the second being the safety, and the third being the cost and the sustainability. Uh, first, uh, in the fe uh, terms of the features, if you walk the length of the sidewalk proposed, uh, if you walk the length of the sidewalk in the proposed project area, you will see that the side sidewalk is in disrepair. Generally, as a group, I believe that Art Show members would love to see this project go forward just as much as anybody else would. Um, we want this area to be beautiful as well. Um, as a local citizen, I feel that the repairs are necessary for safety and beautification um, and that the, you know, that is long overdue for this area. The real obstacle I, here is the proposed landscape strip between the sidewalk and the street curb, and we've covered that in great detail. Um, Planting this area will effectively narrow the walkable area of the sidewalk area and seriously impair access to and from park vehicles. And this would not just be for art show members. This would be for the general public seven days a week, as mentioned already, with um, strollers and children and us with our display materials. Um, it's just... They're, the planting around the lamppost with the trellises that are high so that people can see them when they drive or walk by um, would be beautiful and it would serve everybody well. Um, the safety issues, um, I think safety should always be, in cons be considered first. Uh, the proposed planted area will, will surely encourage people to unload tables, chairs, strollers, uh, children, 
sports equipment, and this is, again, seven days a week, not just on Sunday for the show, um, street side to avoid the plantings. I mean, I respect plantings. I try to avoid them. And uh, to be honest, the amount of space with the extra hardscape next to the curb just isn't enough space for people to operate um, freely to do those things. Um, anybody who drives or parks on Cabrillo Boulevard any day of the week uh, knows that that's, it's a safety issue to get out on the other side of the street. I mean, on the, other, on the street side of your vehicle and do those things. Um, okay, could you wrap up, please? Uh, yes, and then Don Williams. So anyway, um, and if people park out further from the curb, this will further uh, in, uh, crowd the lane of traffic for cyclists driving, uh, riding their bicycles by, and it's just it's not a good plan. So um, just the highlights of what I had left were that um, in terms of sustainability, um, plantings of any kind, um, especially in an arid climate like ours, need maintenance. They need water. Um, I, the project I've been, we've heard here this evening, to maintain this project after it's done is going to cost nearly $60,000 a year. Um, and uh, it's just, it's just, um, mm -hmm. it's not good. So anyway, the last thing being, um, I would love to see this area sidewalk replaced as we all would. Um, it would sadden me to see this project completed as planned as it neither serves the community or visitor needs and puts all at risk. Adding thirsty landscaping in, is both environmentally and socially irresponsible, I feel, and in, in our local case, it is also not financially sustainable. Um, okay. At uh, the last, I was at the final approval meeting with the HLC and both Mr. Aguilar from the redevelopment and the Parks Department said that there were no funds in the plan to maintain this landscaping once it's in place. So um, then I feel that the art show is a, a major um, local piece of history. It has sustained uh, people, it's given us incomes, it's given visitors pleasure, and I think, You've used four and a half minutes I think it deserves serious consideration in this matter. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you. Don Williams will be followed by Kellen DeForest. Just count I'll make mine quick to make up for her overgoing. How's that? I'm a 37-year resident, 14-year art show member. And I feel like you guys really want to get rid of us in an indirect way. Um, the sidewalks definitely need repair. I watch people tripping over those things for 14 years. I'm right there at the crosswalk to the kids' playground. The city put a trench plate down there in the crosswalk. I had an art show member. I watched her. I'm on the thing for the paramedics when they showed up because she tripped on the trench plate, trench plate, hit the cement, paramedics, fire department, police, because the city did not mark it as a safety. It was this high, a five-foot-by-five-foot plate in the crosswalk for a month. I had to finally call and say, if you guys don't spray paint orange around the edge, I'm going to do it. Well, it got fixed. Mm -hmm. There's been booby traps. You can't believe what's down there. It's, it's unbelievable. But anyway, I would like to see plants. I'm an ornamental horticulture major from Cal Poly. I love plants. I love Santa Barbara to be beautiful. But we're 42 years of a historic event. We're a historic, um, where is I wrote down the perfect word here. We're a tradition. We're not a landmark. We're a tradition. We have people from all over the world coming to us every single Sunday. I have people from Russia, Poland, you name it. But we need more room on the sidewalk, not less. Strollers, get a stroller out of that car and park like they did. And the van, it had to be parked just like that. When you go down, I go at 6 in the morning to get my parking place to be in front of my booth so I don't hassle anything. And I, because my back, I can't handle lifting a six foot table and I don't have little buckets like that. I'm a fused glass artist. I have heavy glass to lift down there. I support four people. My, I've grown up here. My parents were teachers, UCSB, math, Hassan Marcus. I just feel safety over scenery. So there you go. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Kellen DeForest will be followed by Rich, I think the name is Stranger. Yeah. Good evening. I'm Kellen DeForest, and I was born in Santa Barbara. Does anyone realize that the reason for the city originally hiring the Olmsted brothers to can you pull your microphone down, oh, please, there, so we can hear you. There does, you go. Does anyone realize that the reason for the city 
originally hiring the Olmsted Brothers firm to design the parkway was that the city fathers did not want the beachfront to become a collection of curio shops and other shops that had appeared in many California cities lining their beachfronts. This even occurred, and I can remember it, that uh, West Beach, Cabrillo Boulevard and West Beach was lined with such shops. We thank the city for going forward with the East Beach project back then in the 20s. Today, it is not lined with tacky shops. From an aesthetic point of view, the arts and craft fair is not really attractive. It could be said that the stalls mimic the curio shops that the boulevard was designed to prevent. I realize that the arts and crafts fair is important to both its vendors and to the tourist experience. I would like to suggest that other locations be explored. Could not some blocks of State Street, such as between Cabrillo and the railroad station, uh, be blocked off as is the as the portion of State Street is for the farmers market on Tuesdays? That would solve the accident problem for the vendors. Despite this observation, I think the city has done a masterful job of accommodating both the craft, the arts and crafts fair at its present location and in retaining some of the historic landscape design and retaining some of the historic landscape design concept. I urge the city to deny the appeal. Thank you. Thank you, Rich Dranger. Uh, and the last speaker will be Tony Fisher. Good evening, Madam Mayor. That's that you're doing well. I am. I'm back on my feet. I just <laughs> wanted to come here as a concerned citizen, and I'll be a little bit biased. My partner is, uh, is Marilyn. Um, I think that it's not a matter of supporting or opposing or this us and them kind of mentality that's grown up about this issue. It's more of the concern of what is going to be good for the community at large. And that's what I've witnessed not only on Sundays, but all during the week. I go to the fact that I've basically never seen most of these people down there on a Sunday or d during my numerous walks that I take during that time, where I've witnessed, um, like the one person member, uh, mentioned, uh, with the problem with the grate. The cones that were sitting up there were utilized by the soccer field. So basically, um, other people of the community took and destroyed something that was set there as a safety precaution. And that's where I see this going to is much like the Stork Placida, much like the sidewalks of, uh, on, on State Street, having to be redone because of impact by the community at large. And that's why I think we're here tonight is to make you aware of any money that would be spent in redeveloping or everything would be saved by having, be, having this project be redone and re-landscaped. One other point I'd like to point out to you is <clears throat> that the uh, mention of 18 inches or walkway space in there. Remember this one thing. You need to get on the inches, microphone, though, because the TV sorry, 18 inches there. <laughs> is the maximum width that you are allowed to park on a street. Now, what's going to happen is you're going to bang your ankle getting a baby carriage out. You're going to bang your, you're going to uh, not be able to get your baseball gear out or your football gear or perhaps your display. So the next time you park, you're not going to park 18 inches, you're going to park 24 inches. And that 24 inches is going to get further and further out into the street. And that's why I was talking with the uh, learned policeman that we have in our presence, is that 18 inches is the maximum allowed with. What you should do is park a vehicle closer to the curb to prevent any accidents. So I hope you, you know, again, put this into the perspective and concern that that will be my final category is that uh, 
most of what I've heard here, I've not heard the community being involved in any of these negotiations or any of these things. I've never seen any of these people that profess, uh, purport to be experts and concerned citizens at this arts and crafts show, show witnessing it or at any other time. And then also the final thing is that this risk concern of endangering not only the person that's getting in inside out of the car, but the poor individual like myself driving down the street getting into an accident. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. That was very well done. Good. Um, so it is to the City Council. Tony, Tony Fisher, last one. Right. I jumped ahead of you and I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> didn't mean to do that. So go ahead, Tony. Good evening, Madam Hi. Mayor and members of the Council. My name is Tony Fisher and I've lived here since 1973. Um, and this is the first time I've seen a battle of the video clips. Uh, <laughs> and I, I think it's the way of the future. And uh, I, I think the one on that side was the winner, uh, if we're judging uh, impact uh, and maybe uh, reality. The reason I'm here tonight is I read the article in the newspaper and said, there's something missing in this evaluation of what's going on, or at least not getting enough emphasis. And that is that the real applicant in this project is the redevelopment agency. It is your public agency, and it's the redevelopment agency that's doing the project. And the redevelopment agency exists to remove blight, both physical and economic. And I think there should be more emphasis being placed in the consideration of this project in making sure that the businesses that are most impacted by it, and they're, what, 100, 150 at one point, um, <clears throat> who are most likely to be negatively impacted as this project goes forward. And I think there needs to be more time, consideration, and attention to solving their problem. That is a big problem. If this arts and crafts show is becoming smaller and smaller because of difficulties of dealing with the physical getting there, you know, Caltrans put in that red curb. Uh, that doesn't mean we can't move it over and fix it and make it work again for the people who were there. We talk about the state being some unknown out there. I don't know how much negotiation has taken place, but Clearly, when this agreement was signed in 1995, they knew the Arts and Crafts Show existed. And they would think that the Arts and Crafts, I don't think they had any intention of trying to remove the Arts and Crafts Show. I would, when I came to Santa Barbara, that was shortly after there was all that stuff about uh, should there be it, and it became an ordinance, and there was an initiative, and uh, that was all. From that point till now, I've always enjoyed that show. I looked around my house before coming down here tonight and noticed how many things are sitting there that come from that show and how many things I see elsewhere when I go visit relatives because I sent things to them <laughs> over the years. Um, I'd hate to see the Arts and Crafts show become a footnote in an historical report. And I think this can work. I do think it needs more time for everybody to sit down. You know, does the landscape have to be a squared area? Can it be ovaled out, give more space? Uh, I mentioned the idea of stepping stones. Somebody said it was talked about but rejected. Um, I think this can work for everybody, but I think the redevelopment agency should be exercising its role a bit stronger. You have to preserve historical, but I think you also have to preserve the economic vitality of the businesses who are functioning along that strip of road. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We are done. Okay, it's to the council, Mr. Horton. Um, well, I've lived here since 1949, and um, Everybody has to so start with and I've, date. I've been to the show many, many times, and I love it. And I don't, I don't want anything uh, bad to happen to the show, so I'll just make that clear right at the outset. Um, when I came on council six years ago, 
uh, this was a, an area of town that I thought needed to be improved. Um, my wife and I walked down there. We're, we're down there every other day at least. Uh, the sidewalk is awful. It, it's it's not uh, conducive to to what I think our city should have. Uh, it it is uh, unsafe, and I and so I'm totally convinced that we need to do a project down there. I think that the site uh, does does have many constraints. Uh, I I learned of constraints, particularly with respect to traffic and loading and unloading. Um, recently, uh, we have constraints uh, with with the uh, loading zones. I think we also have uh, historical constraints which have been uh, spoken to by the HLC, uh, and design constraints, and uh, Kellum DeForest is, is well aware of those. And it seems to me that uh, what they've done is to um, try to meet those constraints. Um, I believe there has been dialogue between the, between the parties. I, um, I've looked at all this material, and I, I just have to conclude that there's been considerable amount of exchange. I don't think it's been a one-way street, at least not, not from my perspective. Uh, I think that the uh, the landscaping. Uh, some some people have commented on that. It looks to me like it's been chosen with specifically with drought in mind and with uh, the idea that the landscape would be hardy and, and strong. And uh, I can't fault it. I think it's uh, the right landscape for the right place. Will people walk on some of it? Yeah, I think they will. Um, but I believe that it's it is the correct landscape. I try to visit art shows. Um, Wherever I go, I recently took a trip out through uh, Utah, Arizona, New Mexico, visited art shows. I didn't see too many where you could load directly from your van to your site without walking a few steps. Now, I'm, I'm sure there are some where you can do that, but at least the shows that I saw require some rolling of a, of a, of a cart or, or walking a little bit. And so um, the fact that some people would, would have to not load directly to their site. I, I just think that's probably the way it is in, in a lot of shows. As far as the design goes, uh, it seems to me that it's, it has been a good compromise. I know that the safety aspects have been considered. I've already spoken to the fact that I think the landscape is, is adequate, is, is in fact better than that. I think it's great. And so I am, uh, I'm fine with the uh, plan. Um, as proposed, I, I do think it's workable, and I do not want the art show to go away, but I don't think it will. I think the art show will be there 20 and 40 and 50 years from now, and I don't think this will hurt it. I think in the end it will help it. Okay, Mr. House. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, this, I agree with uh, many of the things that uh, Mr. Horton just said. Um, the um, uh, One of the key things that I believe about this project and I think the, um, <clears throat> our Parks and Recreation Department um, had this in mind when they started out on this, was that the, um, the art show, arts and crafts show, is um, a very, very important part of the reason and the, the um, uh, basic theme of, of, of this project. And it needs to, we need never to forget that. This is a part of our living history. It's part of our contemporary rendition. Um, it is literally uh, iconic for Santa Barbara. It's part of the... Um, a part of who we are seen to be in the world. And those pictures uh, circulate widely, and we bring our families to the show during the, the weekends and um, when they come to visit, and people come from all over to participate in that. And it's been around long enough to have earned a place at the table for this discussion. And I think it's had that, um, but I think there are things that could um, uh, really uh, make this be just a little bit better. And we're close. We are close. I think, and I think most would agree. The biggest part of the landscaping along the um, street is is continuous uh, landscaping. If I'm correct, now there's sections in this part where the where the um, craft show is that will that, as you can see here from the diagram that's up on the on the wall, will not have continuous strip. But there's areas beyond the show that go all the way down to Milpa Street in front of the hotel that is that continuous strip that we're uh, we saw like in the postcard, that kind of a concept. Um, so I think that uh, we now focus in on these issues as they relate to the show and how we can help sustain the show. Um, I am very intrigued by the very small tweaks that probably don't even raise an eyebrow at the state level and could be helpful. Literally a two-foot path in the middle of the 12-foot segment. Not a big hit. 
or as and I hate to add an extra thing, but as uh, um, Mr. Fisher just said, why aren't or or an oval shape? But the concept being to really help get the access across right in the middle of that 12-foot segment, which would help two of the show vendors at, e um, uh, at each of the places, the artists themselves and the craftspeople, have a load to carry. And there's no reason why we couldn't make a small tweak like that without significantly changing this, uh, this look and feel of the project. A um, little separate from that. Uh, we've already heard, I think, from Mr. Allen that there is a way to be more accommodating at the the um, easterly side of the show. And this can be done with, uh, it's sort of not related to the, the actual appeal, if I understand this correctly, but it's something that we can do, and, and why not? The, there's a yellow zone, for instance, that could be extended an additional, is it 40 feet? Am I correct in that, about 40 feet? No skin off of anyone's nose, and that would be extremely helpful in an area that now is red zoned. And then for an hour to an hour and a half in the morning and the same in the evening and the shorter of the two versions that we saw on the screen, there is a way to at a very minimum cost and trouble um, with participation from the show um, have a um, staged or phased uh, loading and unloading area which is already accommodated for an existing plan by gaps that are already planned to be there and has already been approved. <coughs> so. For me, I, th I think that for me to be able to be supportive tonight, there's a couple of things right there that I would really need to hear are going to be able to, to happen. And, the, and then, then I'd like to hear a little bit of discussion. We have a little more time here, a little more discussion on the distance between the curb and the plannings, and I'm particularly concerned um, about that just from an operational point of view, is uh, we've got to be appreciative of the effort that so far has gotten us to a, um, the 18 inches plus the 6 inches for the curb. That was a real step in the right direction. What's another few inches? I mean, could it, could it work just a little bit more so somebody's not tipping over the edge of the curb? So those are the things that I'm interested in hearing a little more dialogue about and just see if we can't get that compromise that will send us home. Maybe not everybody happy, but at least the intent of the project is retained and some, a little bit more accommodation to address the needs and concerns of the arts and crafts show. So while, while I'm here at the mic, let, could we initiate that conversation? What, from a staff perspective, of those things that I just discussed, could we accommodate and do without ra raising a big issue at the state or causing the whole thing to have to go back to the drawing board? Okay. <laughs> they are conferring. <laughs> Madam Mayor, Council Members, sure, Council Member ahead, House. Mr. Aguilar. I'd like to have our, our consultants to speak to that, but I would just like to lead in with the fact that from the very beginning, we, we, our approach to this was to start very, very much on the side of the spectrum where it was all hardscape. I mean, we brought a plan for that was almost all hardscape. And we were told that this, this was unacceptable, and, and that was at the HLC as well as through our historical consultants and their assessment. So our next step was to ask how close to the bone can we cut yeah. because it does not serve us as project managers or the community to hold anything back. So that's where we started and that's essentially what we brought forward when the Arts and Crafts Show first saw this. So uh, there might be some misunderstanding that there appears to not have been a compromise when in fact the compromise was right. done in, in advance. So uh, and I also like to and I think our consultants can um, articulate much better than I in this this aspect but um, it's very subjective as to, you know, what's a significant. That's something that Councilmember Schneider was asking earlier. And it really is subjective, and it's based upon the design. And our, our consultants would need to see the design visually, uh, do some math, and go, well, how, how much landscape is left? Is this still fulfilling that element, that characteristic of the promenade? Um, with that, I'll, I'll have uh, post hazel time speak and continue on. Thank you, Mr. Eggler. I just do want to say, I don't think, at least from this council member, I don't feel that there's any misunderstanding. I know that you've all been trying very hard to make this work out. And I just think we're down to these very, very minor little tweaks. I'd really like to hear what might be possible. Okay. It's hazel time. Oh, let me turn that on then. There. Thank you. Sure. Um, Mayor and council members. Um, as we noted in our, one of our letters, I believe, dated yeah, November 21st, for. there is a possibility to tweak the design somewhat. But we would have to see the design, as uh, Mr. Aguilar said, in order to judge how much of that is tweaking or going to the point that we feel it would require 
further review by the state level. And whatever plan would be chosen, it needs to be linear because that's the historic character of that planting strip. So one that was more oval would be not in sympathy with the original design, which featured a linear planting strip. But it, as we said in the letter, it's possible to include some refinements in some areas to potentially you know, help out in the terms of access. When we were looking at it, of course, we our charge is to apply the guidelines. And we do understand that the craft fair is a very important component of the waterfront. But we need to look, and our charge is to look further in the future and how to preserve this resource for future generations and not just for now. Okay. Well, could I ask you then straight out, could we, sure. could you consider, uh, I'm not, you don't have to answer me 100%, but two, two foot strip in the middle of a 12 foot planting. There would be a, a walkway. We could consider that, yes. As we noted in the letter, that would be, I would, but we'd have to see in terms of all the individual planting strips, how many of them there are, I can't say off the top of my head, yeah. and how much additional hardscape that would represent. But that's something that, that could be considered. It would seem to be, you know, relatively minor, sort of off the cuff, but there is a concern that would have to be, you know, more closely evaluated. And as I noted, uh, um, I mean, it's a possibility. Yeah, because there's, I think, how many gaps are there now? How many 12-foot planters? You're saying how many lamp? How many 12-foot segments? Yeah. Uh, See, these are the middle, the ones in between the two oh, lamp the posts. Middle. Yeah, I understand. Yes. The how many are there? I don't, I cannot recollect the precise number. Does anybody know? Three, four. The, I, want, I really want us to do some work here because we're that close. Yeah, I, I understand your goal. But from a preservation standpoint, we would have to see the plan. But as I said, there are there is the potential for doing some adjustments to it, as long as they preserve the linear aspect of that planting strip mm -hmm. and don't incrementally add up to a significant amount of additional hardscape. Um, because as noted, I think there's around 18,000 square feet of planted strip, and it's being reduced to seven, which is less than half. And we're pretty close, as we note in the letter, to the, it's not a tipping point, but there's a point where you take away so much of it that you end up with a significant adverse impact, as we noted. Completely understood. Yeah, okay. Six square feet for each 12-foot segment yeah. is what we're talking about. Yeah, I, I, clear. Yeah. And you said that that's not, a, that doesn't appear to be a big deal. But I, th I think we're saying that, as I said, off the cuff. I, I we, we don't evaluate, I mean, it's hard for us to, uh, Dr. Post and I to evaluate that without actually seeing it. But yes, as I noted, that's a potential that okay. might work. And, all right. Okay, thank you very much. Maybe there's others. I would like to hear the answer to the other things. Madam Mayor, it's so important. It's like we, we could get the answer from our staff that are here and they still have time to comment. The, yeah, there's other ahead, specific things that we, we've asked for. The problem, you, Madam Mayor, okay, members of the council. Yeah. If you look at the drawing up there, you can see we're, we're already talking about a very small amount of landscaping. I mean, it's almost minuscule. Um, I do take exception to one thing that was said. Me and my wife live downtown, and I attend the art show regularly. Mm -hmm. I buy Christ well, most of my Christmas presents there. I shop on State Street. I'm very I, Everything I can buy downtown, I buy downtown. So I do take a little exception to that. Uh, one of the comments that was made about using pavers, such as ESC and Central Park, that wouldn't meet the Secretary of the Interior's standards because it would be a material that is not compatible with the existing uh, poured concrete sidewalks. Additionally, it's not allowed, pavers are not allowed uh, under the EPV guidelines, which is as part of the EPV. So we wouldn't be able, that's why we came up with this idea of the smaller scoring pattern to meet the Secretary of the Interior's standards, provide as much paving as possible. I mean, when I've been down at the show, there's one of the artists that brings a big old school bus with a, something growing out of the roof of it. That would take up well more than that space. Why couldn't that person park where one of those uh, planting strips is and, and let somebody else that needs the handicapped access, ac access have uh, an open spot? So I think that there's, you know, there's been a lot of compromise made. The HLC worked very hard to try and, you know, minimize the impact as, as much as possible, but still, keep some of that historic flavor that we're trying to keep down there. And I also believe that Mr. Lavoy would like to uh, address uh, this oh. issue also, if that's okay, okay with and the then on the And then on the, um, the staged or phased uh, area as well. I just want to, yeah, we haven't heard yet if, if these things really can be done, and if they could, it would be great, but if they can't, let me know. It would, it would probably, 
It would, it would likely, if we were to, to do what you were talking about, which is putting the, the two-foot strips through the, the planter areas, um, we would have to have the, um, the landscape architect weigh in as to whether, once we, if we make these planting areas too small, then they're going to be even more, less likely to be um, saved from being trampled. The smaller they are, the more likely they are, they are to get trampled. The larger they are, the more likely it is that uh, people will walk around them and, and, and recognize that there's a planting strip there. But I, I would like to, uh, if the council would like to hear from uh, Mr. Lavoy, chairman of the okay. HLC, he can uh, shed some light on this also. Okay, Mr. Lavoy. Madam Mayor, members yeah. of the council. Um, we started with 19,000 square feet of landscaping. We now have seven. Yep. I think we've compromised. We may have compromised the historical character and significant historical character of this historic district. Any more takeaway, and you will be over that threshold. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, and then on the operational, please, I'd like to know about the um, um, about what could be done and whether it has to be part of this project in the discussion tonight or if, it, if it's a separate one. But this has to do with the loading and unloading for the area where, that was, where it was red zone because that became a significant issue um, that, that came to light during the course of this process. And I believe that we've heard from our staff yeah. that it is possible to work something out at a very relatively uh, small cost that could support the, the uh the easterly end of the show. Yeah, Mr. Allen. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of the council. Yes, we uh, can add additional yellow zone uh, at that one area, mm -hmm. approximately 40 feet, something that we've explored. We'd have to go out and lay it out. There's the possibility of adding an, uh, enough area for maybe two additional cars to load and unload mm -hmm. you know, in that one area. You know, we have laid out an option. We have put together a traffic control plan that could be implemented by the Parks and Recreation staff, you know, which requires the closing of a lane if that's what a direction the city council wants to go in. Um, you know, our recommendation is to use the, the existing loading and unloading zones rather than a closing of a lane, but that is an option to open to council if you want to go in a different direction. Thank okay. you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Williams and then Ms. Schneider. Let me ask the... Um, Appellant, from your perspective, the, what's needed more is um, more space closer to the curb rather than more space through the plantings, right? We need a little more of a setback from the curb. The plantings shorten back slightly. If you can only get one of those, which would uh, <laughs> that be? The, the minimum they're equal is uh, the a larger setback from the curb without stating the obvious. Mr. She's wheelchair is 22 inches wide. That leaves him an inch on each side before falling into the street. So I really question whether the answer has been made of the ADA requirements. So, um, well, that's a, se a separate question. Yeah. Separate part, is, is, is right. did, I never heard a staff reaction to the ADA requirement charge. Um, can, can we get Browning to yeah. respond to that? The uh, city's requirement on the ADA, we, obviously the sidewalk has to meet certain standards in terms of slope. You know, and the sidewalk on this area does meet the ADA requirements. Also, when we do put a curb cut at the corners, there's a slope variation that we have to meet as well. In terms of the parkway, there's not a requirement to have hardscape in the parkway. Um, that's not required in the ADA. If you look at this project, there's a lot of hardscape in the parkway. Right. And so, you know, so there was areas where a disabled member of the community could get in and out of their vehicle. I know a number of years ago, a couple of years ago, a question came up from members of the Arch and Crash Show about adding additional handicapped spaces on Cabrillo Boulevard. Our supervising transportation engineer at the time took a look at it. And because of the volume of cars on Cabrillo Boulevard and the speed that they are traveling and the width that's available, we do not feel comfortable adding any more blue zones on that street. In fact, you know, our preference would be to take off what we have there, but we're not going to do that. And, you know, and it's just there, not safe. And is there adequate uh, curb cuts um, uh, in terms of, of yeah. meeting code and all that sort of stuff? We do have curb cuts at the corners, okay. and, and they are uh, code compliant. And so we feel there is uh, adequate curb cuts. And then, then if you look at the areas, you know, we have the uh, parking lot at, uh, at the end of Garden Street, and there are a number of uh, disabled uh, parking spaces in the parking lot as well, which are ADA compliant, and that's our preferences. 
poor or disabled members of the community use the handicapped spaces in the parking lot, you have more protection to get in and out of your vehicle versus trying to load and unload on the street. You know, sometimes there's a difference between uh, doing what you want to do and do what, what you can within the constraints of a project. And if we um, upheld the appeal tonight, w my feeling is that in a very short time we'd be back to square one because uh, we would be violating the historical character of the street as interpreted by the state. I'm not saying that that's an absolute truth, but as interpreted by the state, these are experts in, in looking at the state requirements, and we have to trust them. And I know them, and I trust them. Um, I would uh, consider uh, helping as much as we can within the bounds of that, uh, but I also don't want to punt this right back to HLC and begin this merry-go-round once more. So, uh, you know, I would say that the, the, the to me, what the direction that this council should should take is to deny the appeal, but to request a, of staff and the hist and the consultants to look at how much push the envelope as far as you can on how much additional inches we could get uh, from the curb to allow it. I think it's real important also to note that the challenges faced by faced by um, uh, the arts and crafts show by this project can be ameliorated by two things. One is um, a little bit more help from the city in terms of the red curbing and uh, in terms of uh, lane closures. Uh, and I do think that we should support the, uh, uh, the elimination of 40 feet of red curbing. Uh, and if the Arts and Crafts Show is willing to pay for the staff and, and hard costs of it, um, do lane closures. Um, but to me, the, the challenges can be uh, overcome by um, coordination. There's no reason why everyone needs to park there, right? I mean, they can park there, unload, um, go around the block, go to a parking spot, and let another person park and unload. I mean, uh, from my perspective, uh, seeing the experience of State Street, it actually could get you a lot more customers because what the the the, the business owners on State Street have have concluded is that they would rather have the most convenient parking, not for the pe for themselves or for the people that work for them, but for customers, and it seems to work. So I, I, you know, I, I just think that it's important to note that um, as much as I love the show and I can remember being a little kid coming to the show for the first time, um, it's not the only use, and we cannot design a whole boulevard that's the entryway to the city looking only at your needs. We have to look at the constraints posed by the state. We have to look at the constraints, in my mind, of creating something that's, that's really beautiful and usable by the whole citizenry of the city. Um, so I'm going to, I would, I would move to deny the appeal, but uh, to add as many inches as, as our historical consultants can uh, see fit to. I'm sorry, okay, but I'm not following inches to the... Inches on the, the curbside. Yeah, but to the width of the hardscape along the curb or to... The width of the, of the hardscape along the curb to allow easier movement. Okay, and what about the yellow zone? They're talking about changing... I'm not, I'm not sure that's the purview, our, our purview in this at, at this time, but if, if we can ask Mr. Allen to do that, I think he'll... he'll um, quite... Okay. Das, is it understand we won't go back to SHPO on this? I don't want to go back. Okay. <laughs> I don't blame you. Ms. Schneider. Oh, this is painful. <laughs> I think this, this is sort of all good intentions go awry. I think everyone in this room wants to see a beautiful boulevard, wants to see it happen quickly, and wants the arts and crafts show to thrive in a place that's, that's been there for, for decades. Um, we get, and as Mr. Williams said, you know, have these outside constraints here. Um, I, I also just want to put out there, I, I asked a couple of questions um, some have been answered about the ADA requirements and so forth. I asked what the budget was for integrated pest management and ongoing maintenance of the plants, and I got a $62,000 per year um, cost. Uh, including, that includes plant replacement and staff time for maintenance, and that does not come out of the RDA, so I think it's just good that we know that that comes um, from either the general fund or the waterfront, and I'm not going to have that argument today about which <laughs> fund that comes from, but, uh, but not from the RDA, and that's ongoing um, additional cost there. Um, 
I got to ask, though, the skateboard park, how did that go through the uh, the historical... Six to one. No, 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 no. I mean oh. with the state. <laughs> oh, I mean I'm the sorry. state. No, I love this. I think the skateboard park's great. I, I'm not... I don't mean... But, but in terms <laughs> of... Here we're talking about inches of plants. And yet, yeah, here's the skateboard park there, and it had. It, I assume it had to go through the same process of whether it was considered historical or did it oh, mess up oh. with the historical nature. And you don't have to answer that now. I wish I asked it yesterday, no, but it, it, it's going through. You know, there was, there well, was boy a boy seems to have an answer. Oh, you have for an it, answer. Though. Well, I, okay, no, then you have an answer. Protests. It was, I mean, a little more. The mayor wanted it. It's going back to the old Chumash State Board. Very, very briefly, uh, uh, it was denied by the Landmarks Commission right. and upheld by the City Council on appeal. On a okay, but, but, my, but that wasn't my question about the city. It was getting it approved by the state, which has to you have to go oh. through this approval process through making sure that it's still a historical area, right? Um, Ma so, Madam Mayor. Yes. Mr. Jacobus. Uh, Madam Mayor, um, I, fortunately, I wasn't here when that happened, so I can't be held responsible. <laughs> I mean, it's always possible that maybe it didn't go to the state and that... All right, well, so I maybe remember. I shouldn't have brought yeah. that up. Yeah, okay. so let's, let's <laughs> not go there if we can. <laughs> I don't remember that, going Mayor. to the state. Yeah, Mr. Uh, just in response to that question, yeah. the district, the designated uh, requirement was the former state right-of-way, now the city right-of-way, not the park. Okay, the there park. we go. There's the distinction. So there was, I, I was here, <laughs> and there was no requirement that it... Thank you. Be. All right. Yeah. That makes a big difference. Uh, this is the... Whenever you look at, we just had today issues. Hemispheres Magazine, United Airlines has, you know, put 30 whatever, some major pages about Santa Barbara County in here. One of the first pictures you always see is that crescent. Um, that's what, you know, the, the Conference and Visitors Bureau looks at the waterfront. This is what people think about when they think of Santa Barbara. To me, the Arts and Crafts Show on Sunday is a prime, prime, prime part of that. Um, and making that work is important to me. Uh, also making the area beautiful is important to me and replacing these sidewalks is desperately important to me and they need to happen the longer we wait the more expensive things are going to get and uh, the more convoluted it's going to get. So by any means I don't want anything to go back to HLC and design review and all that. But I wonder if, and this is where I can I can agree with Mr. Williams, If to me the, the, what, everything I've heard it's not necessarily the length of the plantings you have to walk around, although that is some impediment for some cars, but it's the distance from the curb to the first area of the plantings. And if there's some way that that can be widened just slightly more, inches, six inches maybe, if that's a way that under the post-Hazeltine letter that um, where it says, while it's possible that the approved design could undergo refinements, would that be considered a refinement? Um, so that way it is easier for uh, people to get in and out of their vehicles with their equipment. Um, I do agree with Mr. Fisher. The, the video wars, uh, the, the arts and crafts show won. I mean, the, the, little, um, the little recycling bins, I'm sorry, that's not an arts and crafts show, but moving back and forth in terms of reality. So to try to make it so it works, I think we can do this in a way that doesn't then prolong the project. We can go to bid in the spring and make this thing happen already. So, um, and, I, and I believe what I'm saying falls right into what the motion is. Mm -hmm. And I think will help the Arts and Crafts Show quite a bit. Thank you. Okay, that was a question though. I'm assuming that's to a correct statement unless I'm, um, um, uh, I'm assuming that I would be supporting the appeal, I mean, su su supporting the motion because what the motion is saying, it's denying the appeal and, and to, going to back to staff to do a few more inches yeah. here to try to work it out, not go back to HLC, not go back to design review, okay. and try to try to accommodate just the in and out of, of moving the equipment from the from the vehicles to the site each Sunday. Okay. Okay. Um, <coughs> Mr. Madam Mayor, I, I can answer the question. Sure. Uh, typically on these appeals, um, council has been um, uh, open to direct certain actions to follow. Right. Normally, it's normal protocol when you revise a project is to have it returned to HLC for concurrence. It's very difficult for you to uh, give direction to change this project without having consultation with our historian. So sure. if, if, if the proper direction would be to probably refer it back to staff to work with the historians to see if, if they can conclude uh, the exemptions could still uh, happen. And um, as a courtesy, we'd, we'd extend that uh, decision to the HLC. Uh, as far as uh, what changes may, may or may not occur. That we do not want this to open up the process again to have yeah. a debate about, you know, inches of landscaping. Right. 
And I think that's what we're all saying. You wouldn't, you wouldn't want the ping pong match to start. Right. So yeah. you could direct staff to look into that issue. Yeah. And, and my feeling is simply to push the envelope. I trust uh, uh, Post Hazeltine and staff to, to figure out how many inches we can first push the envelope Extra. on. Yeah. You know, I, if it's two or if it's ten, whatever you, you know, whatever we can do without um, setting this back to square one. Okay. Uh, Ms. Falcone. Well, and the answer might be zero, so we have to understand that. So um, this is this is a competing interest here, both of which have tremendous merit. And so I think for anybody to say that we haven't given this due consideration on all sides, well-rounded, they would just be mistaken, or you know, not really looking at the facts as they as they truly have unveiled. I think a 55 percent reduction in the planting area is more than significant. Um, in no way, shape, or form do I want to see this issue take it back through the process, through HLC, through SHPO, heaven forbid. Uh, this is a sidewalk project at the, end, at the beginning of the day and hopefully at the end of the day to fix some major safety and aesthetic but the safety is most important for the hundreds and possibly hundreds of thousands of pedestrians that use this strip of sidewalk every year and, and over time. So that's, that's really one of the foremost concerns, to preserve the lineal aspect in this minimal way, I think is reasonable. I really do. I understand it's inconvenient for a few, but I don't think it is going to be a kind of a sky is falling scenario. I just, I just, you can't get me to, to think that from, from the pictures or really anything that I've seen. Um, not everybody gets the chance. This one woman gets up at six in the morning to make sure she gets her place in front of her booth. Well, that is not the case for everybody. You know, some people get to park on the street, some people don't. And I'll bet it's not the same folks every time either. However, that being said, I do not think that closing a lane in, on a Sunday when the kind of traffic, as was mentioned, is trying to leave town going southbound is in any way, shape, or form makes sense on any level because what's going to happen, and I, I understand that the motion does not, does not mention that. I heard Mr. Williams say that we no, could the, the motion does not, does, not, does not mention it. We just want to ask staff to, to look at how they if can. If they can pay for it. Right, because we're not going to um, expend funds in that way. But it also is going to create, I mean, everybody's talking about Milpas Bridge and how the bottleneck backs everything up. Well, people are traveling southbound on this route just in, in terribly large numbers, particularly on a Sunday. And to create a bottleneck like that, even for a few hours during that day, I think is a, is a, a nightmare that um, we don't want to visit on, on anybody, particularly. I mean, the police department, the pedestrians, the arts and crafts show. I mean, it's going to be a tremendous clog. So that, no. Looking at moving some of the red curb to yellow curb, which I do understand the motion contains, at least looking at and seeing how much we can do on that, that I, I can support. But that may be the only change in this that I can support because I think we have reached a place of true compromise. Not everybody's going to get what they want. Dear Lord, I know Mr. Lavoie is not particularly happy about this. So, you know, other people, everybody has to give an inch to keep everything going. And um, so I'm perfectly satisfied with supporting this particular motion uh, to move forward and to please let's go to bid on the sidewalk project. And if there is a way to constrain the plantings a wee tiny bit without opening up the process, then fine, let's try to accommodate what they're continuing to ask for. Um, but if the answer is no, 
then I'm okay because I think that a lot has been given and um, a lot has been received and uh, so that's that's where I am on this and this is not easy it's very difficult but I also think that once it's on the ground construction will be a nightmare no doubt about it but once it's on the ground I don't think it's going to be as bad as people think I really really don't and if it is horrible well let's you know we can always take another look at it you know a year after it's in the ground or something it's not part of it's not an amendment mr. Williams it's just a um, a reality of the situation if it's god-awful we'll bring it back but I don't think it's going to be thank you for all your work everybody thank you for all your time consideration I know this has been a very long process I was around when at least three of us up here allocated this money the first time so thank you mr. house Thank you, Madam Mayor. I, I had a question for clarification on the motion, and I um, just want to um, uh, maybe uh, talk to Mr. Williams for a second about this. The um, issue of a loading zone, um, the unloading in the morning and loading in the afternoon, I know Ms. Falcone has a very strong position on it, as we just heard. Um, any, I've been down there at the end of the day, and, and things aren't uh, that congested, and they're at the end of a, a Sunday afternoon uh, when they're wrapping up it's not the peak period actually it's a time when it's pretty surprising at how empty Cabrillo is there are there's cars and there's traffic but it's not the uh, great streaming out of the city that, that one might imagine and um, I was intrigued by your motion that it included a reference to uh, to going ahead with that but your caveat appeared to be that that uh, that the beach show would pay for it I, I guess uh, this is a, a question of staff to me, because the red curbing and the um, uh, is not is not in this item, it's it's associated with it. I'm not sure that we have the the power to change that tonight. We can ask staff to make that decision and the staff purview to make that decision. If I'm wrong, I'll I'll be happy to make some some changes tonight. But I'm just trying let, to let, let me add one more thing to before we ask for to staff. Procedure. I know you guys are shocked that I would. Stick to proceed. Let me ask one more thing, uh, Mr. Yeah. Williams. <laughs> one of the things that was asked, I know that the um, the uh, art show folks had volunteered to provide volunteers to to, to person this thing, and there was a uh, that, point at which that's that not something that, that no, no, I, I think we can. It became that. clear that that wasn't a good idea, and then the, the, there was a fairly high price tag associated with it, and I know staff went and revisited that and came back with what is actually a very modest one and perhaps much more responsible because it would be people that were under our management. So. Mr. Armstrong, did you have? It? I know Mr. Allen, but actually, looks actually, like I'm Mr. A Armstrong. I'm a little con confused here. In terms okay. of the the additional loading zone, that's something that we're going to study and uh -huh. maximize the amount of loading zone we can put there. We don't need that as a part of the motion. It's something my staff has already made a commitment to do. Um, uh, Drew and our staff and trans okay. transportation operations are going to do that. Uh, so. I'm talking about the lane closure in the PM configuration that we discussed. That's what we're talking about. The the yellow loading zone. You've already agreed to right. do so that. So the lane closure. I'm not sure if I here. I, you know, we've put together a traffic control plan. We're willing to move forward with that. This that is the direction of council to explore. Um, I just want to be real clear that it's you know you know we've put in the budget. You know the mm -hmm. project can pay for the cones and all that. You know, it's going to be a 12,000 roughly, you know, plus or minus cost to parks and recreation for staffing it. Um, however, if we find either the police department or transportation operations okay. staff has problems with how it's operating, we're going to have to uh, stop it. Understood. You know, so but right. you know, I want I want to make sure we have you know clear direction from council. That's something that you want us to at least explore sure. to see if that's something that can be uh, working. We want to try it out. Uh, before we go through the, the expense of buying a bunch of cones and equipment to make sure it can in fact work on paper it looks like it will work but in reality and practicality we're not sure yeah. so we want to do some trial but you know I want to make you know I want some direction for council on that one well thank you and this is the this has to do with the viability of that end of the show that end of the show since the red curb has really very well suffered and that's the reason why I've been I'm, I'm per perseverating on this issue it is because it is critically uh, a critical component to that whole about a third of the show is affected so it's not a small thing it's it's a big thing and that's why I asked for clarification uh, is that part of your motion Mr. Williams? Well, I would suggest since, since it is not part of the project that I, it would not be, um, uh, that would be a Brown Act violation probably to include that in the motion. So maybe since uh, Mr. Allen seems to want a, a straw poll on it, 
separate from the motion, we could just say, yes, we want them to look at, at lane closure, or no, we don't want them to. So let's, why don't we just vote on the, on the motion yeah, of, we can't deny, have two of denying the appeal yeah. and adding, adding however many inches we can do, and then do a straw poll on the lane closure. Okay, but first I would like to to really thank the arts and crafts people and everybody, our volunteers, our resident volunteers at, at Landmarks. I don't think your pay is is uh, commensurate with uh, actually what you do. You should be paid a lot more than you are. And um, and and Parks and Recreation Commission and everybody that's worked on this for so long. I am, I, and I don't think we have. Maybe we have, but I don't feel like we have. Um, let the Arts and Crafts Show know that we are very, very supportive. It is really one of the gems. Without you, I wouldn't have any patio furniture. I wouldn't have a medicine cabinet. What else did I buy down there? <laughs> some purses and all those things and some wonderful things. I mean, I, you know, we, and I really consider it good for the residents as well as the tourists. Uh, and uh, I think we need to think of some other ways to really support the Arts and Crafts Show. And I'm not quite sure how in publicity or whatever it is, but I think we need to do that. Um, but that's not what we're talking about. The condition down there is just unacceptable. The 1928 sidewalks, um, we just need to fix them. I've had some emails that have said, just leave them alone. And I don't think you want them to be left alone. We don't. Uh, I don't think most of the residents do either, so um, I don't think we can leave them alone. We really have to fix them. And I walk down, I used to walk down there every day, and uh, I went down there Sunday at 7 in the morning and watched some of the unloading, and it's done very well. And there were spaces at 7 in the morning um, that you could have parked. You know, there were empty spaces in between some of the cars, and I know that it fills up quickly, but... Um, but I think you're going to be okay as, along with maximizing the loading zone, whatever you can do with that, and also um, working on that lane closure. And I know it's going to be difficult, but it might really help the crafts area down there. So I, I think all, all we need to do whatever we can do uh, to help them out. Um, Mr. H uh, Mr. House, did you? Can we do your... that? Well, we have a motion on the table. Yeah, I know. we do. So, uh, and, I, and I'd love to hear about the lane closure before we vote on the on the part that's on the table. But I guess it's could we straw vote it? Is it possible to do no, that? No, I think we should vote on the motion first, or we're going to get all confused. And the motion is to um, deny the appeal. Is that it? Period. To deny the appeal and to. Uh, refer back to staff and, and post Hazelton to determine how many inches that they can add they can without, out um, yeah. uh, without 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 Mr. Uh, Cunningham beginning right. the process <laughs> all over again. Okay. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. No. Okay. One no. Okay. Okay. And, and that, my suggestion would be then to to for the benefit of staff, not that this is. We, we cannot make a motion directing lane closure at this point, in my, is my understanding, but we can do a straw vote. See if we're willing if to we're willing work to on it. We that. want staff to work on it. Okay. If we want staff okay. to work on it. So uh, I, I am supportive of, of lane closure. I think that's probably the most su uh, supportive thing that we can do yeah. uh, to them. Of course, if the police department says, no, we're going to get some people killed, I don't, I'll, uh, you know, my position changes from that. So, but I think we should at least um, allow staff to examine that for the benefit of the of the arts and crafts show. I'll second okay, that. And like well, to wait, it's Helen. not a motion. We're just going to no? just tell what each of us think, Ms. Ms. Schneider. I I, think I understand you. the need behind it. I think it will be a nightmare, um, frankly. So I, I I don't think that it's worth having the time to go through doing a lane closure on a Sunday, especially on that boulevard. So I'm. I'm sorry, but I can't. I can't go for it right, right now. Okay. When I was down there on Sunday morning, it would have been wonderful to have, just because you go in and out, and instead of having a red curb there. So I'm, I'm going to support it. And if it doesn't work in the afternoon, it doesn't work. But uh, I think by the time people are closing up, it's not that crowded down there. So, um, so I would support doing that. So that's two to one, Mr. Horton. Uh <laughs> Safety first. Um, I don't think it'll work, and I'm not in favor of it. Okay, Ms. Falcone. Well, I think I made it perfectly clear. I think it's a terrible idea, and I think there are other ways to accommodate and supporting the craft show in, in different ways, but I think that closing off a lane at all on Cabrillo Boulevard on a Sunday is, is a terrible idea. Okay. So I can't support it. Mr. House? 
Yeah. You kind of know how I feel, I think. No, it's by now. no then. Okay. I, I, I support the idea of, of, of giving it the trial, and I, okay, I do three, like... Okay, 3 is, a, is yeah. a denial of it, so there you go. Okay. Okay, um, I think the balance on this sort of thing is so difficult, and we get to cut the baby in half. I sort of feel like we did today. Um, with the skateboard park, it was the same thing. We cut that baby, and we plopped it right down in the middle of the art show. I hated it. But anyway, it's yeah, already there, the, uh, and we do like this. On that. She has had her hand up for a while. Well, there's no point right? of order, but why don't, you, why don't you come on up to the microphone and or to see? Well, we've already voted. I know, but that's why I kept putting my hand up. I had four minutes left for rebuttal. Um, well, well, I don't know what the, I'm going to do about way, that one the right only, now. The only way procedurally that would happen is if we called on you, and so um, we should maybe um, do that. But I, I Well, I don't know. What, I mean, what do you want me to do right now? I would like my four minutes of rebuttal. Mr. Wiley, what do you think? I want to know if I can do that. We've already voted. Madam Mayor, I, my reaction is that uh, it should have been requested sooner. And, and it was only requested just just recently, <laughs> pretty much consecutive, concurrent with the council deliberations. And and I think it was pretty clear that the council had been deliberating for quite a while. So I, I think it would be fair to say it was waived by not requesting it sooner. Okay. Okay. And with that, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you.